Very good evening to all of you in India and good morning to people in US and Canada and uh, good afternoon to people in the uh, UK and good night in people in Singapore. Let me have the pleasure of inviting you all for this IRSI Very good evening to webinar all of you in India and good OC, morning to people OP. in US and Canada. Which is a very, very and interesting and, uh, good webinar. Good afternoon to people in the uh, UK on one and good night in people in Singapore. Singapore. We have, let me faculty here. have the pleasure of inviting you all for this IRSI. Very good evening to <laughs> webinar of you in India and good OC, morning to people OC, in uh, US and Canada. Is a very, very and interesting and, uh, good webinar. Starting with the president of the UK and good night to people in the panelists. Very soon. Let me have the pleasure of inviting you all for this IRSI. Very good evening to webinar of you in India and good morning to people in US and Canada. Very, very interesting good afternoon. Starting with the president of the UK, one key line, people using the panel's willingness to sponsor this webinar. Let me also tell you the pleasure of inviting you all for this. IRSI, good evening to the webinar of India. Start of this morning, people in the United States, and good evening, starting with the president of the UK, one key line, people using the panel's willingness to sponsor this webinar. Let me also tell you the pleasure of inviting you all for this. IRSI, good evening to the webinar of India. Start of this morning, people in the United States, and good evening, starting with the president of the UK, one key line, people using the panel's willingness to sponsor this webinar. Start of this morning. He left UK and came to India to start this fantastic company. And then subsequently, Kishore and also Nikhil have taken over the legacy and probably kept the flag very high as far as Entold Pharmaceuticals is concerned, as far as India is concerned. It's an international name to reckon with, and we're very proud to be associated with uh, the Entold Pharmaceuticals as well. Now, before we go on to the OCOP webinar, I would like to request uh, Mr. Rahul of Intro Pharmaceuticals to show an introduction video for about 57 seconds about the Intro Pharmaceuticals. Thank you very much, Rahul, Raman, and the entire team of the Entod International for the wonderful videos, very inspiring story. I only wish that all the ophthalmologists and all the delegates have a glimpse of this wonderful, inspiring story of Entod Pharmaceuticals and Entod International, which has become the pioneer as far as the pharmaceutical industry is concerned. And we know that they are also a very big supporter of the CME programs. And this year, they have been a very, very big supporter of the webinars. 
They entered online meetings. And today, the IARS like COP program is a perfect reflection of the fact. Friends, I'm going to share my screen now and go on to the main program. And uh, are you able to see my screen? Yes. Yes, sir. Uh, this is the IARC, as I told you, the Indian Interocular Lens and Refractory uh, Society of India. I'm thankful to Professor Amar Agarwal for having given this wonderful opportunity to me for conducting this webinar. And this is a one case, one pearl webinar, which is going to be for the next two hours. And we have a wonderful team of panelists, as I told you earlier. Professor Maipal Sasde, who is the chairman of the Center for Sight. He is a household name, in, not only in India, but also the world over. He is also the, currently the president of the All India Ophthalmological Society and how he is literally leading the AOS to greater heights, even during these challenging times, is really a fantastic uh, task by, by Dr. Maipal. Dr. Maipal is held up in another webinar. He'll be joining us very shortly. We also have with us Dr. Professor Namrata Sharma, and who's also the secretary of the All India Ophthalmological Society. He's also the gold standard as far as the cornea and cataract surgery and refractive surgery is concerned. She's a professor in the RP Center. Ames, we got several publications and several innovative work as well. We also have with us the panelists, Dr. Gaurav Lutra, Chairman Academics and Research, IARSI, Director of Drishti Group of Eye Hospital, Dehradun. And Gaurav Lutra is a very dynamic cataract and refractive surgeon. He's got a beautiful hospital in Dehradun, a very, very excellent speaker as well. And also with us, the Kamal Kapoor, we, I call him the Delhi Hurricane. The medical director and co-founder of Sharpsay Group of Eye Hospitals, they've got more than uh, 20, 25 centers in the Delhi and NCR and also as well as abroad. And he is also a fantastic cataract and refractive surgeon. So with these few words, the panelists, the, I will tell you the pattern of the webinar. I am uh, Dr. Mohan Rajan. I'm the moderator for this webinar. Along with me is Dr. Ravi Shankar, who's going to be co-moderator for this webinar as well. The pattern of this webinar is that We'll be uh, 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 having <coughs> 10 speakers. The speaker number one is, as, as the speakers come in, I will introduce each of these speakers. Each of these speakers will give a video or a challenging case for about three to four minutes. After that, I will shoot some questions to the speakers and then I will take it to the panelists. And then I will ask all the speakers, other speakers also to comment. And then we'll go on to the audience questions. The audience link is there with uh, Kamal Kapoor, as well as with Dr. Ravi Shankar, as well as Dr. Nishant as well. So this is the pattern of the webinar. We hope to finish in about two, 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 uh, two and a half hours max. We don't want to um, uh, 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 drag it beyond that as well. So let me introduce the first speaker now. The first speaker is none other than Professor Dr. Ronald Hugh. He's a, what do you call, he's a, well-known name, not only in Singapore, but also in the Asia-Pacific region, but also in the world as well. He's a consultant in SNEC, Singapore National Eye Center, which is the apex center as far as the Singapore and South Asia is concerned. He's the director of the Eye and Retina Surgeons Associates. He's the past president of APACRS, and uh, he's, uh, I would say that it's been a golden era in the APCRS when Ronald was the president. And he's also the professor NUS graduate medical school as well. Ronald Yu is a very, very prominent cataract surgeon and he's a very innovative, powerful speaker and his videos have won Best Videos Award in the, in the, the ACRS and ACRS as well. And he's going to talk to us on a very, very important topic today. I'll stop sharing the screen now and over to Ron, Ron Yu for this one. Thank you very much, uh, Mohan. Let me just bring my screen up, if I may. Well, I'd like to thank the um, IRSI, Mohan, and um, Amar for really inviting me to t join join you guys uh, tonight. Um, can you see my video now? Uh, can you see my screen? Yes, yes. sir. 
Great. Okay. okay so thank you. So one case, one pearl. I'm going to share one pearl, but use several cases to de demonstrate this. And my title is really the on block maneuver for soft dish cataracts with hydro delineation. All of you have heard me speak on really the neither here nor there cataract. We know that heart cataracts, are, you know, in India, you guys are all experts in doing heart cataracts. Can you be a little louder, sir, Ron? Sure. Yeah. Soft, ca soft cataracts, um, you really just aspirate, but the neither here nor there, I like two techniques. One is the pre-chop for the 50 to 60 year old, and the on-block technique, which I'm talking about now for the 30 to 50 year old. So the heart of the on-block removal of the soft nucleus is hydro delineation with the golden ring that frees the nucleus for easy removal with vacuum. Let's look at this. Hydro dissection is done first, and then the hydro delineation step, from which you can see the gold ring appearing very, very clearly. After that, clear the cortex in front of the nucleus, go to memory two, impale the nucleus with your phaco tip, and lollipop the nucleus onto the tip of your phaco and the operation's over, right? I mean, you've taken out this small soft nucleus and now the epinucleus is removed, which is why you also need to hydro dissect and not just do hydro delamination. Let's look at a second case of this same technique. Again, here we're doing hydro dissection and hydro delineation really almost in one uh, movement. And you can see that this one, there is a much larger golden ring. Again, after clearing away the pre-nuclear cortex, you go into memory two and impale the nucleus. But you can see here, it's a little bit more difficult. Why? Because this nucleus is bigger and it's a softish nucleus. But because your hydro delamination you know is good and has freed the nucleus, this nucleus then uh, comes uh, really into the port of the phaco tip very, very easily. And again, this operation now looks slick instead of you trying to chop a very soft nucleus. Let's look at another example of this. Hydro dissection first, nucleus has moved. Hydro delineation now with the golden ring uh, showing very, very clearly. And now I like to use the uh, uh, live OCT to help us understand what hydro delineation actually is. And if you look at the two images on the right, you can see that layer of fluid at the back. Um, in both of these uh, really angles at which the cut is taken. And when you've lollipopped and taken away the nucleus, you see how the beautiful empty space left by the nucleus with the epinuclear shell is left uh, uh, behind. Now let's just look at one other case. Now in this case, you can see that this nucleus is much smaller and I'm able to free at the back. You see the fluid level at the back and then you see the fluid level at the front. So you know this nucleus is now totally free for you to lollipop onto your phaco tip to make this soft nucleus much easier to handle, okay? And here's just a still image of what a hydro delaminated nucleus will look like and what it looks like after it's been removed. So my last uh, video clip here is one more hydro delamination and you can again, uh, see this small nucleus being delaminated. In this case, there were actually two golden rings. And if you look carefully, you will see that there's a small nucleus here and there's actually a larger uh, hydro delamination ring outside there. Now, if your hydro delamination golden ring is very large, sometimes it's hard to pull the whole nucleus out. And what I do is revert to my favorite pre-chop technique that Akahoshi taught us. You go in and just split the nucleus into two. And then, of course, it's very easy to pull each Hemi nucleus uh, out of the eye. So just to sum up, the on-block technique for these very soft cataracts, hydro delaminate, you must see the golden ring, also hydro dissect so that you can get the epinucleus, clear the cortex, impale and lollipop the nucleus, and if the nucleus is very large, won't come, you can pre-chop or chop it as well. Remember, we don't only get the dense, hard, white, black nuclei, we get the soft ones in these days of refractive cataract surgery, and you really need to deal with these things. Please. Thank you very much. That's it. Beautiful. Fantastic. I think, uh, yeah, I think it is a perfect opener, uh, Ron. I think um, because everybody knows that hard cataracts are tough, but many people do not know that soft cataracts can be more difficult than the hard cataracts mm -hmm. or even the small people's. Okay. And I think you have given the message very correctly. Before we go on to the panelists and also the audience questions and other uh, speakers, I want to ask you one thing because you got in the term 
because you got a best video award in soft cat tracks in acr as a couple of years mm-hmm. back i know very mm-hmm. well but you got the term called nhnt cat tracks i remember that very well so neither here nor there, nor there. Yeah. neither here nor there okay whatever you showed that i think your rexus was a little larger than the normal that's what you aim for in soft mm-hmm. cat tracks I, I don't really, you know, uh, Mohan. I try to keep a, a standard size for the IOL because I think it should be dictated by the IOL cover that we want with the rexus rather than the density of the nucleus. Uh, I'm, I'm, uh, what is the size of the rexus? Five point five or my rexus is usually about five to five point five. Yeah, five 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 to five point five because uh, the the cases the first two cases you showed was it really mm-hmm. soft and either way if you do a hydro delineation it's going to lollipop up. Mm-hmm. Okay, but the nhnt cataracts are the very tough cataracts as you know very well and you have described that very nicely these are cataracts with never chop never crack never suck as well and very difficult to hold also mm-hmm. so what are your take home messages for nhnt cataracts which are neither here nor there in between well, essentially it's recognizing them uh, mohan I, i think it's if you go in and you just do and don't think about it, just do a stop and chop or a direct chop as you noted you can't grip them so to me the most important thing is making a note in your clinic that this is a neither here nor there nucleus and then either do this good hydro delamination with on block or you do a pre chop technique because stop and chop is the wrong technique for neither here nor there cataracts or can we make a very uh, narrow trench all the way down and try to do what is called the stop and chop well it depends on which end of the soft spectrum it is uh, mohan you're absolutely yes. right and if yes. you say about 1 plus 1 to 2 plus yeah of course you can but if you're less than 1 plus the half plus nucleus you're going to struggle cracking those rotating those and gripping those so it's really recognizing in your clinic in your notes how dense this nucleus is absolutely i think these are the golden messages from uh, uh, ron i think he's the expert in soft cat tracks and being an expert in soft cat track is if you are expert in soft cat tracks you will become an expert in fake emulsification mm-hmm. it's the other way around the hard cat tracks because you have got everything to hold you can chop easily whereas soft cat tracks you have nothing to hold the nucleus Absolutely. you don't have any control over the nucleus so let me go on to gaurav and kamal gaurav what's your um, uh, how differently you would have done a handle soft cat tracks i want to i enjoyed uh, ron's presentation you know it's all the his, his presentations are always really nice uh, he showed on the oct especially that how the hydro delineation and how you can dissect out the nucleus uh, i handled them uh, you know i used the lollipop technique as well for this but i also enjoyed doing the um, cartwheel fake for the soft cat tracks and uh, you know that seems to work although it can be you have to be very careful about your settings mm-hmm. and then of course uh, you know soft cat tracks you have to improvise all the way through i mean as he said you have to first identify that you have a cataract what what is the kind of the cataract that you're dealing with and you have to improvise on the table if you have a slightly different from the usual cataract and you're not going to chop them so i think uh, recognizing them and then improvising and knowing all the techniques is so important you know some surgeons say chop everything i don't agree with that you have to know all your techniques you should know divide and conquer stop and chop i mean a good fake surgeon should be able to convert from one to the other to the other on on the fly i think that's the message i would like to give absolutely agree gaurav i think you hit the nail on the head uh, uh, before we go on to kamal i want to ask ron how do you very it's very difficult pre operatively for me at least to find out whether with uh, uh, this side or that side and because unless you put your fake probe inside no you do not know many times that uh, it can be very deceiving so pre operatively you have any take home pearls to find out what side of the um, uh, softness is there whether yeah. it's on this side or that side I think that's just experience Mohan you know when you look into a, one of these I any mean, age is the other thing as I gave mm-hmm. a guy 30 to 50 year olds this usually works uh, quite well but if you see a dense nucleus then it's not so easy really the denseness and the yellowness of the nucleus I think is an important guy but what you say is right so I may go in like trying to do a pre chop in a soft one but if I find it's too hard then I just don't do it or I use a counter pre chop technique so you need to be able to change your thinking and your technique as as Gaurav has said said on the fly and not just be dead set and on one plan if you find that the eyes different so you should have a plan a plan b and plan mm. c for this cuz of cataracts kamal what's your take on that i think uh, ron a wonderful presentation Thank and you. Uh, as usual you know the very crisp message especially with the ost running through the live stream uh, it's very difficult very very easy to identify what's happening my only little small tip for beginners would be 
make sure that you do not give a burst of hydro flow in going in because that can sometimes suddenly make the nucleus rise up or probably the whole cortical plate rise up and in case you have a slightly smaller capsular excess you may land up with a capsular drop number 1 number 2 before you start this procedure make sure that you've taken off some of the viscoelastic out because as you give the pressure of the fluid in the viscoelastic can come and actually block your wound and especially if it's a cohesive viscoelastic sometimes it can get blocked and it can surge out number 3 this maneuver is best avoided using a side port do not use a side port to do this Absolutely. maneuver use the main wound and the most important is as gorov said it's on the fly you you know you cannot always have it 100 times 100 or 100 the same step in a soft cataract you actually need to be thinking in your head that what's going to happen next and if it if that doesn't happen your next ace from your next rabbit from your hat should come up uh, so i think soft cataracts as dr mohan said are a trick by themselves so you need to keep modifying so you need to be adept at all the techniques but yes this nuclear scoop or this uh, the nuclear delivery technique is fantastic and it just solves the problem in a matter of minutes the surgery is over in a few minutes one or two minutes mohan can i just make one last comment yeah you know in india you have all these mature cataracts and if you rupture a capsule during a dense cataract you can say you came late it's your fault <laughs> but you need to know the how to handle this off cataracts because if you rupture the capsule you do not who do you blame right you can't the you get too early you know yeah no but when you uh, uh, ron and kamal and uh, gaurav uh, it's a uh, because you are doing an uh, hydro delineation as well yeah. sometimes you are stuck up with a very thick epinucleus okay sometimes you uh, is really a problem in removing the epinucleus do you have any tricks for that yeah can i start go sure. yes anybody yeah okay see i call this saucerization it it actually forms like a saucer you have the the and it starts from the capsule rexis and goes through all the bag one of the big tricks i do is at times i can just put in a list of little viscoelastic and use a special bevel cannula just go between the 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 capsule rexis margin and then give a small little jet of fluid and the whole thing will rise up sometimes you just come out of the wound depress your scrotal lip let the wound shallow and this plate will automatically separate in one area and all you need to do do is you go with a you know dispersive viscoelastic between this layer inject the dispersive viscoelastic and you can separate this layer very beautifully i'm sure there are other techniques with dr ron and dr gaurav will share yeah ron any well i i think it starts number one as i've said don't only hydro delineate hydro dissect as well as okay? well that uh, number two um, basically at the end of the phaco step you will often get a feel of whether that epinucleus is going to come or not and if you if you get this rim of epinucleus i will use the phaco tip in epinuclear mode to engage one side of it and winkle it left and right so don't suck it up first just get a grip on the epinucleus and now pull it left and right and away from me and that often will cause the epinucleus shell to come out completely now if it doesn't do that then during ia what's very important is because the epinucleus is often held in place by the cortical bed the bed of soft lens matter so if you just free all the cortex around you'll find that then the epinucleus shell will come out so i think those three things will help you get that epinucleus every time absolutely remarkable gaurav you have anything yeah, i think i think they they got all the points but what i would do beyond this like if all these things were not working sometimes i'll go with the infusion kamal already said something similar i'll go with the infusion running from the main port and i'll just go inside and kind of try to flush it out sometimes what that does is it just floats the epinucleus shell into place and you know sometimes it'll actually pop out if it's soft enough if it's not at least you know it'll kind of move inside and mobilize and then you can go in with the you know epinucleus removal on the phaco tip i enjoy doing that but i won't uh, recommend that for the beginners because they could go horribly wrong but if you are uh, you know experienced phaco surgeon uh, you can just go with the you know tip bent to the side a little bit try to engage the epinucleus and it kind of if it's flo free floating it'll just you know you'll, you'll engage it and you'll probably be able to remove it better and then you can finish it off with the ia i think we we all probably do the same thing yeah i think the the Mom, key... i just have a comment yeah yeah i'll i'll come back i'll come to you see yeah. i'm just coming to you just one important thing from what ron said was i think it's important that we remove the epinucleus in one single sheet sometimes what happens is if you go and catch the tip it may it may break there and you will have a piece meal there so that, and then it will make your life difficult maybe try to remove it as you pull it out probably the lateral movements 
probably one single sheet am i right ron absolutely absolutely, absolutely. and uh, we, we go on to these uh, uh, speakers i'm sorry one by one george uh, you have anything to say i'll come to you sri um, I think it's very important what Kamal said that you you know use your viscoelastic in some of these cases and uh, to to raise up these pieces. So you know go between the capsule and the uh, cortex or the epinucleus, and that helps to protect the capsule and also to bring that uh, piece up. So I think you know remember that viscoelastic can be used for other things besides maintaining the anterior chamber. So I think Kamal's point was well taken. Thanks a lot, uh, George, for the nice uh, uh, message there. And uh, Sri Ganesh, you would like to say something now? Yeah, it's always a pleasure watching uh, Ron's videos. Uh, they are absolutely the best. Uh, I just wanted to make a comment that uh, if you have a femtosecond and you're using a femtosecond laser, then you can do the technique of visco chop, which I demonstrated yeah. in yeah. Jaipur APACRS. So all you have to do is just go in with your visco cannula and inject into the grooves of the nucleotomy and the nucleus splits into four and you can just do a single-handed aspiration very easy. I, I have seen the technique, uh, Sri Ganesh is really very innovative, very interesting technique as well, but you need to have the femto for that. Okay, yeah. Sujata, you have any questions and um, any um, uh, suggestions? I think or we, or I any think of the speakers? The discussion was excellent. I think the discussion yeah. was excellent and um, there are several techniques where, where you can do. When we, we started FACO, in soft cataract, we used to do something called as a, uh, the chip and flip. We used to carousel the cataract and then flip it out. And then we also use a spring technique where you make a, a quadrant and then you spring it out. So there are so, so many ways. And uh, like Gaurav said, I think you'll have to change it. As you go in and you see how what is the type of uh, softness the uh, cataract has, you change the technique as it goes. My one technique for epinucleus removal is, I think one of you already uh, spoke about it, is uh, injecting either a viscoelastic or a BSS. After removing the, uh, the nucleus, the epinucleus can be uh, hydrodissected again once more so that you loosen it and it comes out easily. And that's about it. Yeah, any, any of the speakers want to say one. something? One. Yeah. Imagine. Yeah. Imanshu, come. Yes, come. Uh, what Sujata said, and you know... Wait, 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 Imanshu, one minute. Huh? Has Kumar doctor come in because he had some problem there? Back. Back, okay, fine. Imanshu, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. yeah. See, general surgeons routinely use this sub... sub you know, they're, they're pushing saline in between various layers to identify various layers. So what Sujata said, I have got a good presentation on this, how beautifully we can just hydro-delineate from every angle and the epinucleus is ever so willing to come out. It stayed inside for a long period of time. And what Gaurav said, as he said so rightly, for experienced surgeons, it's a little easier to put the phaco tip and pull in the epinucleus. But for a newcomer, if they just push in a little saline for a BSS from multiple angles, it'll just walk out. It's it, it just tumbling the whole thing out. That's about all. Yeah, that's, I think uh, uh, we have said it all and uh, it's a beautiful presentation. <laughs> Fantastic opener by Ron. You, Ron, use uh, videos are really fantastic. And it's a great honor to have Ron in this uh, webinar uh, because he has he ta always takes the ophthalmic education to a different level altogether. Thanks, Ron, for being here. Thank and, you, uh, Ron. Yeah. Thank you. And um, uh, if you have any other, no other questions, any questions from the audience on this, uh, Kamal? I just am looking there. There's still no questions on this. On this particular. No, thing. no okay. questions on this. Uh, okay. Then we go on to the second speaker. Okay. I will quickly share the second speaker. I have a request saying that please do continue such webinars, Dr. Mohan. Thank you very much. <clears throat> the speaker number two is actually a guy who is more an Indian than a Canadian. He attends more Indian uh, conferences than any other average Indian ophthalmologist, I would say. <laughs> George Bako is an associate professor, McMaster University, lecturer, University of uh, Ontario, Canada, and he is really a fantastic guy, cataract surgeon, and more importantly, he is a great human being, a great friend of mine, George Bako. There are two eyes of Canada in the international ophthalmology scenario. One is Dr. George Bako, the other one is Steve Ashinoff, the right eye and the left eye, I would say, because these are the two people who are always there in all the international podiums, whether it's ASCRS, ESCRS, AO, or APSRS or APAO, whatever it is, George Baker is always there for us. And he's going to talk to us on a very, very important topic. And George Baker has got tremendous publications and done a lot of work on glistenings. 
on the, the actress of glistening. He's done tremendous work, remarkable work on that. I really appreciate that guy. And he's got a lot of sense of humor as well. And uh, he's won several OPLs. And uh, I will... Uh, one minute. No, Thank you very much, Mohan. Well, one minute. I'm, yeah, I'm just trying to stop. Yeah. Over to you, Beko. Thank you very much, Mohan. It's always a, a pleasure and um, to be a part of this program. Okay. Is this up? That's fine. Um, yeah, you're, you're, um, uh, you're very audible, no problem at all. I request all the other speakers also to little raise your voice and speak. Yeah. So um, I'd like to thank the Mohan and Society for inviting me. Um, I've been a part of this society for many years, and it's always a pleasure to, um, to be on the program and to learn from my colleagues. Today, I'd like to talk about piggyback IOLs. We employ piggyback IOLs in rare situations and um, sometimes these can go awry. These are my financial disclosures and, and they're not relevant to what we're doing. So when we put a piggyback IOL in, we anticipate that we're going to solve a problem, but the question is, what do we do when these piggybacks start to fly? So it's an unlikely event, but we need to know what to do. So this is a case in which there was a piggyback IOL placed on top of a multifocal IOL and an individual who was a high myope. So the piggyback was used to try and compensate for the residual um, myopic anisometropia. And as you can see, 10 years later, the lens is dislocated. So what do we do? Well, the first thing is, uh, you know, we prepare for our uh, interscleral haptic fixation. Uh, we create our flaps, and then we manipulate the haptics into the uh, anterior chamber and make sure that the lens is nice and stable. Um, in this case, what I'm doing is I'm using the approach the Gabor Shira first introduced. Um, so placing a sclerotomy and then using the handshake technique to grasp the haptic and externalize. And again, on the other side. So we're using the IOL that the patient's had for 10 years, and this is an IOL that's provided him with amyotropia, and I don't see any reason to exchange it. Now we'll put it into the scleral tunnels, do that on both sides, and in this case, we've closed it with uh, sutures. As you can see, you can have a nice stable situation, bagged in the lens, uh, and an anterior piggyback IOL. What happens if the piggyback IOL slips in behind the lens? So we know that we can have zonular dialysis in some of these cases, and these piggyback lenses can then go through that area of dehiscence and go into the vitreous. So in this case, we've got an in-the-bag IOL, we've got a dislocated sulcus piggyback IOL in the vitreous. And the approach, again, is very similar. We'll create our flaps, as we do for the glute IOL technique, as Amar has taught us. Um, 180 degrees apart. You can see that this patient had a PK, and that's why he ended up having the piggyback IOL. Uh, luckily, in this case, the IOL is very anterior, so we can go in with a hook and uh, isolate the lens and grasp it, then go in with our 23-gauge forceps on the other side. Using the handshake technique, we can externalize the haptic and do that on both sides. So the IOL is in behind the in the bag IOL. In this case, it's very important before you do this that if the posterior capsule is intact, that you do your YAG uh, because it would be very hard to do that once this is done. So again, sternalize the haptics, we put them in our tunnels, and then we glue, and you have a nice stable situation in a post PK patient. And then the most difficult one is this one in which the patient had a piggyback IOL and both the in the bag lens and the piggyback were dislocated. So, uh, and he had a small pupil. So what we've done is we've increased the uh, pupil using our pupil retractors, created our flaps. We're passing a 9-0 proline uh, through our uh, scleral area underneath both haptics, 
and then we will create a sclerotomy anterior to where we pass that suture so that we can pull the suture through. So again, going to the other side, we're passing the needle underneath both haptics out to the cornea. We'll cut that needle off so that the suture sitting there will reach in anterior to the haptics and we'll tie and adjust. So tie on this side and then we'll go back to the first side and ensure that we're nice and central. So we have both haptics um, caught between the suture and then proceed with gluing. And at the end of the case, you can see that the uh, lens is nice and central and stable. So when the piggyback starts to fly, we need to consider our options and be prepared to stabilize them. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, can you stop sharing? Yeah, really fantastic videos. And uh, the take home message from these videos is that don't try to imitate George Baco's acrobatics. You'll be in trouble. Okay. Especially the second case, whenever I see this case, because I've seen these videos before, whenever I see this case, my heart is in my mouth because it's right behind the lens, behind the uh, regular eye oil, and it's almost in the anterior vitreous. Okay. And you are trying to uh, exteriorize the, um, uh, externalize the aptic and glue it. It's really fantastic. And uh, uh, I was wondering what is the reason for the dislocation or the subluxation of these lenses? Um, don't you use the Rainer Sarcoflex piggyback lenses? Well, these, uh, in these cases, all of these cases were about five to 10 years after the primary surgery. Okay. Um, the first one, there was a, an array lens. Uh, the, the array came at powers of five or six, and the patient needed almost zero. So ended up having a myopic result, and then we placed a myopic lens in the sulcus, and that corrected him. Um, the second case was a PK. Yeah. And so after the PK, there was an anisometropy, and we placed the lens. And the third one, I'm not sure what the situation was, because I thought there was only one lens with the pupil. And then when I opened it up, I saw that there were two lenses there. Um, okay. So, you know, but we don't, uh, yes, we have the Rainer Sarcoflex, but that's more of a refractive lens, whereas these were situations where there was anisometropia that we were trying to deal with. Now, these are the Acrisoft lenses, multi-piece ones? No, no, they're the, uh, the one was the, um, sal, um, sorry, the um, uh, J&J. J&J, &J. Okay. Yeah. What is the overall, what, what is the reason for the dislocation? Well, there's some dehiscence in the zonules, and you'll see that if there is a small area of dehiscence, the lens will turn around and sort of work its way to that area, and it wasn't recognized at the primary surgeries. Okay. And um, uh, you have any experience with the Reno Sulcoflex Sulco lens, George? No, I don't. Okay. No. We go on to Kamal and um, Gaurav. Gaurav? Yes, sir. Uh, you are online. Okay. Gaurav? Yeah, yeah. Tell yeah. me what, what you would have done differently and what is your experience with the piggyback lenses? Okay. So I think, you know, uh, George did an amazing job. First of all, you know, the piggybacks will be uh, very few and then getting a dislocated piggyback. So I think that was a gold mine of uh, cases. And uh, I think the essentially the main reason why a piggyback would, you know, dislocate or, you know, decenter is zonular dehiscence, as George said. So, you know, and you can never be sure because these are all complex cases and you could, you know, 10 years from the time that you place it, you could go ahead and uh, have zonular weakness and the lens could dislocate. So I think you have to treat it as it comes, you know, you have to see what kind of lens you have. And, you know, techniques have evolved so much now that you could actually, some people have actually passed sutures through the optic, through the haptic. You know, uh, there are so many ways to bell the cat, I think. So depending on what kind of lens lies, uh, you know, in the uh, piggyback, uh, you know, is, is the piggyback lens or if it goes behind. So you could modify your technique <clears throat> with, the, with the number of techniques that we have today, sir. Kamal? Yeah, I think you, uh, uh, most amazing videos, uh, Dr. Beko. Uh, as Gaurav said, I agree with him. A uh, lot of times the reason could be a mismatch sizing. Maybe at the level of primary surgery, how much of pressure or force we exerted while pushing in the piggyback? What was the reason for requirement for piggyback would be that during the primary surgery, if there's excessive <clears throat> aggressive maneuvers of rotation of the nucleus and chopping, and maybe it was a hard cataract, so you end up breaking the anterior zonules. And on top of that, you put in a piggyback lens. 
Point three would be in case you used a piggyback lens, which has probably got a squarish edge. Not in the case of a three-piece lens, but yes, a lot of times I across in my practice I see doctors who put in single-piece lenses, hydrophobic piggyback lenses. Okay. I, I explanted two uh, last year, operated by some of those colleagues. So I guess these are also reasons because a square-edge lens haptic sitting in the sulcus is the recipe for disaster waiting to happen. So apart from these reasons, of course, there could be some innate reasons at the pre-operative stage where the surgeon himself was operating could have caused some dehiscence of the zonules. And uh, doc, I agree with Dr. Beko, the lens has the unique tendency to find the dehiscence and it will rotate into that area with the eye movements. And over long it's like duration, the PRL. Should, huh? yeah, it's and like I the think, PRL. Remember? I mean, absolutely. Uh, I just reminded me of the PRL. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. No, no, I'm, I've got a good experience with the sulcoflex lens and we have not seen this at all because of the overall diameter is much better. And also it sits in the sulcus so beautifully, this uh, sulcoflex lens. And uh, let's go on to the speakers quickly. Uh, Shri Ganesh, you have any experience with the sulcoflex or the piggyback? Kumar? If she is not there. Let me unmute, yeah. Yeah, I just okay. unmuted. Yeah, yeah. I use the Rainer sulcoflex. Uh, the only thing with the sulcoflex is the haptics are very long. And I've had a lens where the haptic has torn while injecting. So now I prefer to put a fake eye like an ICL. And that works beautifully as a beautiful, piggyback. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, very nice videos, George. And uh, I was thinking, of course, you can also do a MNA technique now. Or you can also do iris suturing to anchor the haptics if it's a three-piece lens. So these are two techniques also which you could uh, try in such cases. Yeah. Or otherwise, you can just expand the lens and... Uh, Put in a fake eye well uh, to correct the refractive error. So yeah. I tend to go yeah. away from iris yeah, one minute, one minute, because one. iris suturing because I find that I get a lot of CME with that and a lot of problems long term, and yeah. um, so I don't do that. Um, in these cases, they, these were all situations where the patients had good vision with their piggybacks, so I was reluctant to go in and to exchange it for something else. I think going forward, we're very lucky right now because we have a bigger range of powers. You know, you can get up to 60 diopters and you can get down to minus six, minus seven diopters. So we have a whole different situation, but we'll still see these cases from before. And as I said, each one of these was about 10 years out from their surgery, the primary surgery. I'm yeah, sorry for the quality of the videos, but you know, you don't get these cases that often. And I, know, yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I know it's, hard to find. it's really fantastic surgery, but the Shiganesh, See, please understand, I want to do, because you raised this point, we're putting an ICL in the sulcus. Yes. The pseudophakic sulcus is different from the phakic sulcus. If, we, if a multi-piece lens like an Acrisoft lens or a, a multi-piece lens of J&J is going to dislocate, okay, in a pseudophakic, this thing, I'm sure the phakic ICL also, that is the, um, uh, the, uh, uh, the conventional star ICL, whatever it is, you're going to use is that's also going through. See, if there uh, if there is a zonular dehiscence, then yes. there is a risk of it dislocating. Can I add something, Dr. Mohan? But sometimes, oh, yeah. sometimes yes. you can also have a dislocation of the piggyback lens if the haptic comes out. For example, in the three-piece lenses, sometimes the haptic haptic just detaches, and if that happens, or if the haptic is deformed, then you can have a have a dislocation or a decentration and that's when you want to do an exchange if there's a zonular dehiscence it's better to fix the lens and not to just exchange it because if you put another lens in the sulcus again it's going to be prone for dislocation okay. the, the, the chances of dislocation is more with the fake i am uh, that is the i'm sorry the icls than no. with, the, with the with the multi-piece lens because it is thinner and there's a possibility of going through no uh, can i add something no. here Dr. yeah Mohan? yeah Okay, I agree with uh, 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 Shri Ganesh totally. Uh, see, the thing is, if there is a dehiscence, anything will go through. But still, the tendency of a fake lens to go through is slightly less because I believe I have a large series of piggyback fake lenses, which are IPCLs. I've done more than 21 of them. And they behave better for a simple reason. It's a much softer material. The landing pads are thinner and soft. They curl rather than cut through the zonules. Another thing is, the planning of sizing is always 0.5 bigger than what I would have used for a fake ikai. I use a 0.5 to 0.75 millimeter size bigger in my pseudo fake ikais. And it works 
beautifully because I have a large deep chamber, which is approximately five millimeter or above. And I also want the lens to be actually sitting onto the sulcus. So I plan a 0.5 millimeter larger size than I would have if I were just planning a simple IPCL for my patient who didn't have or didn't require a piggyback. I'm going for a 0.5 millimeter size larger. But of course, if there is a zonular dehiscence or zonular loss pre-existing, anything will go. Through. Anything will go. In. Uh, uh, Kamal, the other thing is, other point is in a yes. fake eye, you have, you have a four point fixation. That's what I'm saying. Unlike, uh, yeah. the so you have a four point fixation, yeah. And yes, four, four points of fixation. Plus, you have a much deeper AC. So you can use a extra Absolutely. size. So I'd like this. Right. Okay. Um, um, uh, Kumar, you would like to say something? No, no. It's all or well anything else? So much, Sheila? I have, I have used the uh, Rainer Sulcoflex. As you mentioned, the haptics are large. Uh, Theoretically, it's a single piece, but I loved uh, George's uh, idea that you are refitting the same lens because then the calculation is out of the whole window. And the patient was very happy with the same IOL for so many years. So, refitting it, uh, you know, solves all the other issues of calculations. So, that I think was a brilliant idea. And as she said, you can put the uh, change the technique, Yamane, whatever way you are comfortable, uh, you can go ahead and do it. Yeah. Uh, anybody else uh, want to comment on this uh, particular uh, technique or what? Uh, um, George Baco demonstrated just now. I just want to highlight one thing. If you have this situation and the the, the, the lens in the bag still has an intact posterior capsule, uh, deal with that because um, it's when you have the two lenses uh, later on, it's very hard. So you know the second case where it was posterior and the other one where I sutured the two together. If you're able to deal with the posterior capsule, yeah, get before you do any of these procedures because later on it's hard. Did you do some vitrectomy also for the second case? Yeah, you do. You always have to. Whenever you go into the vitreous, you have to do a bit of vitrectomy. But it, in one minute, you can't show everything. Okay. That's fine. Um, I think we, um, we had a very good discussion on this uh, very, very beautiful video of George Baker. He's always so different from others. And uh, he always comes up with uh, something very uh, unusual. And George Baco always gives some very good messages. Thank you, George, for always being with us. And um, Thank you. Stay, I, I hope you are staying back uh, for the rest of the session as well. So I will go on to the third speaker now. Third speaker is... Uh, Dr. Sujata Mohan, Executive Medical Director of Rajanaikar Hospital, Chennai. And she is a really a versatile surgeon. She does, except for retina and oculoplastics, she does everything uh, in the eye, cornea, cataract, refractive, glaucoma, and um, um, fake eye oils. And uh, all these, she is a very good surgeon. She's got a lot of publications. And... Uh, She's an excellent speaker as well. And today she's going to talk to us on a very, very important topic. Over to Sujata. You can start sharing your screen, Sujata. Okay. okay. Uh, at the outset, I'd like to thank IARSI and Dr. Mohan for giving me this opportunity. So um, this is a case um, of um, a faking bullous keratopathy for which um, I have done a DSEC, a glued IOL with uh, SFT. So this case was a 60-year-old uh, female who was referred for management of a faking bullous keratopathy. She had a history of nucleus drop during FACO followed by past plantar vitrectomy. She had a large dilated pupil on presentation. So the plan was to do a DSEC with a glued IOL as well as a uh, pupiloplasty. As you can see, I'm sitting temporarily in this case um, and I'm marking the cornea just to make sure that we are uh, placing the lens centrally and two flaps are created in preparation for the glued uh, intraocular lens and make, uh, making a sclerotomy. And also I'm uh, 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 doing multiple um, side port incisions so that it will facilitate me during my uh, lamella keratoplasty. And now uh, the lens is being injected Using a multi-piece lens, I, my preference is um, uh, a multi. I mean, you, you have to use only a multi-piece lens in a glued eye well, and, uh, and this is getting fixated into the uh, spiral pockets. 
And now you can see the pupil is large and dilated. So the next step would be to do a, a, a single, a, a single pass four throat pupiloplasty. And you can see that I'm using a micro forceps to stretch the iris so that it allows me to uh, take a nice bite using a 26 gauge needle so that this can be uh, railroaded into it. And um, then the 10-0 uh, proline uh, needle along with the suture is uh, pulled out. A second instrument is used to receive, uh, to uh, uh, retrieve a small loop of the iris of the uh, suture. And uh, it is passed through the loop four times. So basically we are trying to tie the knot outside, but it's just a, a, a fourth row so that it doesn't slip out. And then you stretch it on both sides, you get a very nice knot. And you can use a micro uh, scissors to cut the knot. So next, you, this side also needs the same thing. So uh, I'm passing a 26 gauge needle through the iris and uh, railroading it and using it as a fulcrum. And so again, using a second instrument to retrieve one side of the uh, suture, make it into a, a nice uh, loop. And you can see very clearly in this, uh, how, how many times you are passing the suture. So you have to go around it four times. That's why it's called as SFT, that is a fourth rows. Once you've done the fourth rows, the knot becomes stronger and then you can just pull it and then again snip it off using the uh, micro scissors. So now that the pupil has become smaller, the next step would be to do a, a, a DSEC. So I'm uh, using the anterior chamber maintainer, I'm uh, removing the um, decimates, damaged decimates. Using an air gives a little bit of, uh, you can see the decimates being removed even more clearly. So, because since I have not stained the decimates, this will be much more easier to visualize. And using a sheets glide, on top of which I have put a high density viscoelastic, using the push through technique to introduce the lamellar disc, injecting air, and by repeated trap, uh, tapping, you can center the uh, graft. And after that is done, use the glue tissue glue to uh, seal the uh, scleral flaps as well as the conjunctiva. So the trip, uh, the, the pearl here is that, in this case, postoperatively, the patient did very well, as you can see. And the pearl here in this case is that uh, using a, doing a pupiloplasty is very important uh, so that the pupil becomes small size, otherwise air management will become difficult. And not only that, when you're going to implant a lens and with a large pupil, the chance of glare and the patient's uh, quality of vision can suffer. So doing a pupiloplasty and uh, a single throw, uh, uh, a single uh, pass four throw uh, pupiloplasty really works very well and it's uh, quite easy. It can be done by anybody and uh, it's a very simple technique to learn and it works very well. So that is my pull. Uh, Dr. Mohan, you have to unmute yourself. Uh, yeah, 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 I've done it. Thank you very much, Sujata. You have shown all the techniques in one video. Uh, the uh, video of glue dye oil, the SFT, as well as the DSEC as well. I was wondering whether, uh, uh, I just wanted to comment on uh, two aspects of your uh, technique. One is you are doing uh, SFT, okay? The glue dye oil is fine, no problem. The SFT, you are taking a 26 gauge needle because already there is a iris atrophy on both sides. I could see that, okay? The iris is a little thin there, okay? And you are taking a 26 gauge needle on one side and you are taking it onto the other side as well. Sometimes this 26 gauge needle can produce a big hole in the iris. And sometimes the iris becomes a little more, because it's atrophic there, it can tear there as well. So what is your take on that, number one? Number two is, I feel that your pupil is not adequately small because you're doing a DSEC. You need a good tamponade for that. So uh, you, the, when, I, when I saw the post-operative picture, it was not adequately small. So what is the optimal size of the pupil you aim for when you're doing combining a DSEC along with the SFT or a pupiloplasty? number one, and what is the take-home message for preventing a, a hole in the iris or tear in the iris in an iris which is already atrophied and already thin? Okay, a point yeah. understood. You know, the difficulty is that when you, uh, the, the, if you notice that you use the micro forceps to hold the iris, 
So there's a less chance of pupillary tear. It's very difficult to pass the tensile proline from one side to another. So unless you hold on to something. So that's the reason why I use the 26 gauge needle through the iris. Yes, it's a good point that it can definitely tear the iris if a care is not taken adequately. So if you use a microphoseps, the chances of tear is much less. If you use the microphoses to stretch the iris and then pass it through, the, through that, then chance of tearing is much less. That is uh, one uh, the answer to the first question. Yes. The second question is that in this case, because the patients I had the vitrectomy done and already had a nucleus drop, I didn't want the pupil to be too small because then it will be difficult to examine the posterior segment in the late postoperative period. So that's the reason why I, I didn't make it a very small pupil. I just made it adequate enough so that the air management postoperatively would be good because it's a vitrectomized eye. It's also a very soft eye and the air will not hold if the pupils are not small. So that's the reason why I, I gave a large enough pupil, but not too small. That's the reason why in this particular case, I didn't make it very small. Plus the glued eye wall is also a good scaffold for that. Along with the pupil, the glued eye wall is also a good scaffold for the air too. Yes, absolutely. So it's always better to do the glued eye wall first and then uh, do the SFT and then go ahead with the DSEC. The so we don't, yeah. Yeah. DSEC should be the last thing to be done because you don't want any endothelial damage. If you're going to do DSEC first and do the other steps, the chance of endothelial damage will be more. So yeah. whatever uh, you're doing, you do everything and then you put the graft as a last resort. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think the point is well taken and uh, beautiful uh, videos and nice messages as well. Uh, let let me go on to the panelists. Uh, Gaurav, as Maipal, yeah. Welcome, Maipal. Hi, uh, Maipal. Welcome. Hi. Hi. Yeah. Hi. Yeah, sorry, I was just held up. I I haven't heard the uh, this thing, so don't ask me a question, sir. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome. Yeah, no, no. She showed a um, blue dye well SFT and then yeah. take my pal. So, uh, uh, which is uh, uh, it's a regular walk in the park case for you. You know, I know that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what. Yeah, I want your. Uh, uh, you not seen the video, I suppose. No, no. So okay. let Goro do well. Yeah, Goro. Yeah, yeah, Goro. Yes. Goro, let me know. Let me take from Goro. So, sir, uh, you know, I think uh, you are unnecessarily pulling on Dr. Sujata. She showed such a beautiful surgery and, you know, your your presentation is like one case, one pearl, but she had one case and ten pearls. So, <laughs> uh, so, so I think she did a beautiful job. But yes, uh, the question is very relevant. Sometimes the iris is atrophic and you will get a buttonhole or, you know, you can even get a, you know, tear of the thing when you, especially if you tighten it too, too much or even while passing the 26. So, what I typically try to do is I try to engage... Uh, the iris, uh, one pearl, she already said that you use the microforceps to hold the iris so that you don't tear it. But the second thing you can do is that you, with the ten zero needle, you can come very close to the place where you want to pass the suture and use the 26 as pressure, counter pressure, engage the knuckle of iris where, where you want to pass the suture second and push second. in the... Yeah. Sorry? The yeah. second portion, I showed that. Right, second. exactly. So that is one thing which, you know, she already showed. And I think that's the way that uh, you can uh, avoid having a bigger hole in the iris using the 26, uh, 26 gauge. And I actually use that for passing both sutures, you know. So I pass the first one and then I withdraw the 26, come back and come to the other side and pass the second one also like that. So that way I use the 26 more as a guide rather than, you know, going through the iris itself. That sometimes uh, helps. And yes, I had the same concern as Dr. Mohan about the size of the pupil. Not yeah. otherwise, but for specifically for a situation where you're, you you know, you're wanting to inject air and prevent that air from going behind. Otherwise, you did a beautiful job. But I just thought that since I'm not a cornea surgeon, I don't know what would be the ideal pupil size that you would want to create for that. But I think you already answered that. So thank you so much. Now, if, uh, if Amar is online, if Amar is online, I would like to ask him what will be the ideal size of the pupil? You know, Actually, you if you're looking for the for the uh, for the quality of vision, you may want Amar, it a little smaller. But otherwise, yeah. I think it was adequate. You know, well, I uh, think four millimeters would be ideal. Four okay. millimeters is ideal for pupil size. Yeah. Anyway, Kamal, Kamal, you have any uh, suggestions? Is he there? Uh, for the moment, he is not there. Maybe we should ask. Hey, you. Maipal, you Dr. Somashila, Somashila is a cornea. Actually, Dr. You know. Maipal is already. Maipal I think Kana Somashila, she is a cornea surgeon. Yeah. I know, I know. Maipal is there. Maipal will take yes. his comment. Uh, what exactly you do while doing SFT when, when you already have a thin iris, an atrophic iris, do you take that same 10 o or 9 o needle across the railroad technique or use a 26 or 27 gauge needle on that side? 
No, you can use a 26 gauge needle because I think that is uh, better, but I don't, uh, 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 I use uh, the forceps, I think, which was being talked about and uh, you have to be very gentle and hold it and uh, what happens is that you can either take uh, one needle from this side and 26 and put it there. So that's something that helps and if you have to really do uh, encirclage, then you'll have to hold it with the micro forceps and do that. But okay. normally, normally uh, the pupil, uh, you can just by two, putting one or two sutures, uh, you can actually bring down the pupil. I don't believe in uh, uh, the pinhole pupiloplasty that much that I want to bring down the pupil to two millimeters. I would rather uh, agree with Dr. Shri Ganesh, a pupil of around four millimeters is good. And uh, that also helps when you're doing a desec at that particular time, the air, uh, it keeps the air in the uh, interior chamber and it helps you give, give a good tamponade. So that's the uh, technique that I follow. I don't uh, really bring it down to a pinhole, as Amar would say, get it down to two millimeters or something like that. Yeah, I think uh, she aimed at about 3.54 millimeters. It's good enough. Uh, um, Somashila, you have anything to say? Somashila? Yes, I have been, uh, yes, I've been uh, seeing the video and uh, Dr. Sujata, wonderful video. I think you really have covered almost all the points as Gaurav pointed out and really left nothing uh, for anyone to discuss. Uh, the, the similar, as I think most people mentioned, as Gaurav also said that, instead of uh, pushing the 26 gauge through the iris, uh, what I would also do is simply railroad the 10 zero and hold the 26 gauge right next to the exit. And uh, well, you or you can hold with the forceps, you can hold the iris and then make sure that it's, it's more controlled that way. But over a period of time, you can just push it through and uh, just at the exit, you have the 26 waiting to receive it. And so you don't go through the 26. But you showed in, in the inferior, uh, when you were doing the SFT inferiorly, uh, you did not have to push the 26 gauge needle. So for this technique, I always felt that instruments are very important. Uh, typically, I don't depend much on instruments, but here you have to have good instruments, especially the micro forceps should be good and holding the iris. So just prepare with that. And and Dr. Mohan, you asked about uh, pupil size in terms of the DC. Yeah, DC. Yeah. Yes. So the, it so it's now known very well that if you don't have a small pupil, then sometimes it could be a mess. Sometimes it could be a real disaster because the iris goes behind and pushes up. The air goes behind and pushes up the iris, and you can even have a like a pupillary block or an aqueous misdirection also. You know, glaucoma next day. So because of that, now I've realized, and we've, we've all been doing that, it's very important to make the iris small. And four millimeters is a pretty good size uh, to balance between, to have a good examination of the fundus, as well as uh, to have a good air in the anterior chamber long enough. Okay. Um, uh, anybody else has got any other suggestions? You, to make you should talk? ask George. George has George. a lot of experience with this, yes. Yes, George, tell me. Um, Suchad, that was a fantastic case. You're, you're a great surgeon. I'm not as good as you, so I'm always worried about the um, DSEC um, dislocating posteriorly. I think a good idea for surgeons like me who aren't as good as you is to put a suture through the DSEC material, 10-0, uh, and then once you're happy with the, uh, with the placement of that DSEC, then you can just pull that suture out. Um, because sometimes that material can go behind the iris and fall into the vitreous, and then it becomes a much more difficult case to do. So that would see anything that I would add. Will yeah. you do it in all the cases because this had enough support? Iris was there, and also the lens was there, yeah. so there was no need for it. If it's a, if you're doing on an afeki kai or a very large uh, open pupil, then probably uh, putting a suture would help. But do you think in this case also it deserves to have a suture? No, what I'm saying is I think for you, because you're you're good at doing this, it's not a problem. But somebody who's just starting out and who hasn't done many cases, I think it would be worthwhile to do that because, you know, these things do happen. Absolutely. And even if you have a small people, it can happen. And so, you know, it's it's not a difficult thing to do. It's not and it's not hard to put the, pull that suture out. Okay. And these like flap dislocating into the vitreous can be really messy. And uh yeah, Kamal, you have anything to say since you're back online now? Yeah, I'm back online. There was some trouble with the bandwidth. Now, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you can't see you. Okay. Oh, right, fine. Okay, I, I, I just said uh, Dr. Jodhata's videos were excellent as usual. One small tip, just addition. When we're trying to go through the iris, and even if it's atrophied, holding with forceps, as Sri Ganesh said, this is a tip he gave me two years ago. I used to do my processes with the 26 gauge needle. 
he pointed it out one thing i've learned is the nearer you hold it to the place where you want the, your uh, you know 10 10 zero needle to go through smaller the hole you will have otherwise there's no use holding the iris even with the forceps and you're trying to enter somewhere far away from there you still land up with a larger hole so go as near to the place that's the time you get a very controlled small little hole to tie the suture i think that the reason why i pointed out out that is uh, because the iris was little atrophic and thin absolutely well. and while holding with the micro forceps also please don't try to pull don't the pull iris. don't try to pull the iris if you pull the iris you can end up in lot of uh, problems there it can be really make your life more more and more difficult uh, if you have no more questions any questions online um, no 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 boss okay yeah, yeah. Come on anybody else yeah, so just like So that's yes. an excellent procedure, uh, uh, excellent uh, video, and I think you left Mohan speechless for some time after your presentation. <laughs> and the uh, only thing I I wanted to ask you is, uh, uh, you could use a Bosens glide. I I find that uh, that's uh, less traumatic than sliding it on the glide. Yeah, so that's just I, one I, point. I used uh, to use a Bosens glide, but I think it's a little bit uh, big and uh, it's a little bit cumbersome. Uh, I'm not nowadays. I don't use any glide. I just put it on okay. the Um, and Nishant, do you have to, anything to say? Doctor Mohan, only one question. Yes. I'm not. I'm not getting any questions. So this is peculiar. I, I've still got no questions. So I hope the link link is active. Yeah. There's still no questions. Uh, because there is some problem with the link. Can Rahul or uh, Raman can you check the link whether it's working active? Because no question till now. Ravishankar. Yeah, yes. Yes, sir. It's uh, only questions working. coming are on the ones people who in the waiting room or they've checked in, not on the portal. Okay. Uh, anyway, let me welcome again uh, uh, Dr. Mayapal Sahib, the president of the AOS and the chairman of the Centre for Sight uh, um, uh, all over India, and he's got more than fifty centres, and it's always a pleasure to have Mayapal uh, with us. Mayapal, I gave a beautiful introduction about you in the beginning itself before you came. Thank you. I I I know you always do a great job in introducing. <laughs> Except you don't introduce Sujata well. That's it. <laughs> anyway, we go on to the next speaker. The next speaker is uh, none other than the uh, the Faker Maverick. Sri Ganesh, as you all know, doesn't require any introduction, and uh, he is the CMD of Netra Dharma Group of Hospitals in Bangalore, and uh, very very dynamic cataract and refractive surgeon. He's got a fantastic uh, tertiary, a super speciality eye hospital, very innovative, powerful speaker, fantastic uh, human being, and uh, very good surgeon as well. Very rare to get a very good combination like Sri Ganesh. And it's a, always a pleasure to have Sri on board with us. Over to Sri. Thank you, Mohan, for uh, those excellent words, and uh, uh, thank you for inviting me. I would also like to thank IARSI, and uh, let me show you my case. Uh, okay, I hope uh, you are able to see the screen now. Okay, so I'm just going to talk about. Uh, IUL explantation, and there are many reasons why you may have to explant an IUL if you are put in the wrong power IUL, or if there is a refractive error, if there's a decentration or tilt, then you may have to, or even a multifocal lens that uh, the patient is not happy with, uh, you may have to exchange it for a monofocal. So there are various techniques. So I'll just go through the initial um, commonly used techniques, and then I will show you my technique. Um, so you can. Completely section the IUL or partially section the IUL. Here you can see that we are supporting the lens with the uh, through a side port with a dialer, and you can see this lens is damaged. The haptic is cut during insertion, so you have to explant it. So here I'm using a micro forceps to section the IUL. So it's very important to support the lens either with a dialer like I'm doing or with a micro forceps from the side port. But again, when you are sectioning and you put a micro scissor in the eye, there is a chance that you can hit the PC. So you have to be very careful there. You can section it through and through. Here, uh, um, I section it partially, and then later on, uh, sectioned it through and through, and I removed uh, the two pieces separately. 
you can see that uh, it comes out. But the disadvantage is that you will have to take the micro forceps into the eye and there's a chance of damaging the PC. This is another case where you can see this is the old pharmacia lens, uh, silicon lens. I pull out one haptic, grab the haptic from the side port for support and section it three fourths of the way. Of course, I put viscoelastic under the lens to push the PC away when you do this. And then you, you can grab the lens, uh, bring it out and rotate it so that you don't have to cut it through and through. So these are the common techniques, but you can explant the uh, lens now without sectioning of the IUL. You can remove it intact with this technique. So this is a case where uh, there was a refractive error probably because of uh, uh, <clears throat> mislabeling of the IUL or uh, wrong IUL. So we needed to exchange it. So you can see that you just open so the very most important thing here, what I'm doing is extending the inner lip of the incision. So the outer lip is the same, but you convert this incision into a trapezoid funnel shaped incision. So here, this is the most important aspect. So the inner lip is extended almost by one millimeters. And then I'm uh, staining the incision with trepan blue just to show you the shape of the incision. And now you can appreciate very well that the incision is a trapezoid incision and it's like a funnel. Always it's very easy to deliver uh, a larger uh, object through a funnel shaped uh, incision, just like in SICS when you're delivering the lens or even delivering a baby, the uterus becomes funnel shaped. So this is uh, the lens, which is basically uh, removed from the bag into the anterior chamber. You grasp one of the haptics, pull it out. And uh, once it is out, uh, you can see that uh, you have a, grip on the lens. Then uh, you put in viscoelastic. I like to use viscoat just above the lens to protect the endothelium. So that is viscoat being uh, inserted. You can see the difference in the viscoelastic. You can see the edge. Uh, here I'm, I'm using the RTO, so it's uh, excellent uh, resolution. Then hold the haptic. Then you go in with the micro forceps, just grab the optic in front of the haptic. And then you just have to rotate it. Here I'm rotating it counterclockwise so that it folds. And then the funnel shaped incision accommodates it. And then you just have to pull it out. So you can see that the whole lens comes out. You can also use a hand over hand technique. And you can remove the lens intact. You can see the lens is intact. You're not damaged the lens. You're not introduced any sharp instrument into the eye. So you're, uh, it's much safer. And then you can just put in viscoelastic and then inject your uh, new lens into the capsular bag. So this is a technique. Uh, the, the pearl here is to increase the incision. You can see the outer lip is 2.8 mm. It's the same size, it has not increased. And then you can see that the inner lip is about one millimeter. That's what we have extended it. So I'm measuring that. And you can see that uh, it's under topical so the patient is moving the eye. You can see that this is uh, 3.8 millimeters, almost four millimeters. So uh, this is a technique which uh, I've explained a lot of uh, hydrophilic, hydrophobic lenses also, any type of lens, even phakic IULs. Of course, phakic IULs are much thinner like the ICL, so you don't really have to extend or make it a funnel-shaped uh, incision. But uh, if you want to expand any of the IULs, then you make it a funnel-shaped incision. And then with this technique, you can very easily explant it. It is quite easy. And uh, I think this is the pearl. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. I think, uh, thank you, Sri Ganesh, for the incredible stuff. Um, before we go on to the panelists, I just want to ask you one question. Uh, while, while explanting the lenses, I'm a little apprehensive about the posterior capsule. Okay, So what I do always is do an, something like an eye world scaffold. I put the lens first in the bag, then try to bring this lens up in the anterior chamber, use a nice uh, good viscoelastic like Helon GV or Helon Phi to uh, expand the anterior chamber. And then... Uh, uh, explant the lens, either whatever method you want to, either yeah, yeah. cut or hand on hand taking, whatever it is. The second question I want to ask you is this um, 
the funnel technique can be done only with the hydrophilic lenses Absolutely. if i'm right true you can no, you can cool. do it for hydrophobic also even with the acrisoft lens it comes out very easily in fact this so, lens which i because the hydrophilic uh, molds the hydrophilic molds in my opinion the hydrophobic the, doesn't mold but the hydrophobic so, is thinner this was a, a 25 uh, adapter uh, lens this was a hydrophilic lens but hydrophobic yeah. also i have uh, explained it i i don't have the video yeah and right now but i can show you with the acris of actually it's very easy it's easier than the hydrophilic uh, lenses and even the technis also can be explained so any of these lenses but the main thing is the principle is the funnel shaped uh, incision of course for scaffold you can put in a lens but the importance is if you are taking a scissor micro scissor into the eye then yeah. probably your technique of putting the second lens in first Uh, after explanting the lens into the ac then you put in the second lens into the capsule bag yeah so that that supports and you don't damage the pc but Absolutely. in this technique that issue is not there because <laughs> you're not going in with a micro forceps most of the maneuvering is just done at the incision uh, and externally so it's much safer than taking a micro scissor into the eye have you studied the wound distortion post operatively yes we have done the oct actually <laughs> you i showed you the wound also post op and we yeah. have done the oct also there's not much of distortion and the wound holds very well yeah okay but if, if you try this if you try this with with uh, without making the uh, trapezoid a funnel shaped incision then you can have a tear and distortion so That's it's right. very important to have the funnel shaped uh, incision so in your experience you can even hydrophobic lenses we can get yes, yes 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 okay uh, be, george you are online i know you you done a lot of work on the l shaped incision even for a pmma lens okay can you can you uh, enlighten us on that l shaped yeah so the l shaped incision involves doing a, a 3 mm incision at the limbus and then going posteriorly from that so that you have three at the limbus then you're going back posteriorly about three and then you take your um your your incision and you make it wider on the inside so you kind of uh, shave it uh for another 3 mm into the cornea and into the sclera so there's overall width is about 6 mm and then you enter into the eye and that allows you to take lenses out put lenses in um and there's no induced astigmatism we follow these out for 2 3 years and there's no <clears throat> in the astigmatism so that's the benefit of it and in most cases if you make that shelf well you can actually don't even have to put a suture in so um that's the advantage of having that uh that is mainly for the pmma lenses or for all lenses you do you can use well if you're going to use it for some of the other lenses i mean shrees incision there is about 2.83 mm in order to do that with what we're doing we we've got 3 mm and you can make it up to 4 or 5 if you want and then use the funnel his funnel so um i guess we can sort of uh combine the two and uh, and do it that way but the the important thing is you have to tunnel into the sclera and into the cornea so that you have that big wide closure yeah similar to an sics only thing it's l shaped yeah it's partly in the sclera and SICS partly in the will give you about a diopter of astigmatism so you know if you do the frown um yeah. there's been a number of publications so it gives you about a diopter whereas the l doesn't yeah thank you to george and wo oh, to the panelists maipal what's your take on the shri ganesh yeah. video and uh, what's your technique for explantation yeah i think shri ganesh has shown a wonderful technique uh, actually the entire technique is dependent on the fact that how moldable is the lens absolutely also the second part is the thickness of the lens and the third part is the structure of the lens if you are working with a three piece lens it cannot work because you will pull out the haptic from the optic and uh, it would uh, definitely not be able to give you that kind of pressure or uh, this thing uh, and uh, i think it's a wonderful technique and uh, we have been doing this uh, uh, very often for the icl or the fakic lenses because they are much thinner than that not a problem you don't even have to extend the inner lip of it but shri has shown that uh, extending the inner lip you can actually have enough play for the lens to fold on itself and to be brought out the only one uh, thing that uh, mohan actually you commented which i would uh, wish to disagree a little is that i won't use a gb or a pipe because that would come out as a bolus uh, and i also wish to protect the endothelium so i would rather both i use yeah so i should uh, i would rather 
that has chondroitin sulfate doesn't come out that easily and protects the endothelium. No, no, I use both, but but I want to create more space also apart from protecting yeah, the endothelium. That's, that's two two things. Something that's just shocks uh, in, a, uh, in a minute actually because uh, it, it will come out as a bolus. So that's uh, that's something that I would prefer not to do that. Okay. Uh, that's about it. Otherwise, uh, she is an excellent surgeon as always and comes out with new techniques. And I think uh, it works well. Uh, it would work well uh, more so for hydrophilic and thin hydrophobic lenses. Like he's talking about the uh, Acrisoft. Acrisoft has a higher soft lens. index, so and it's much more malleable. So I would say it would depend on lens to lens. But yes, uh, you might have to enlarge the incision a little bit more. But uh, it is uh, doable and uh, a good technique. Thank you, my partner. Yeah, uh, uh, Gaurav and um, uh, Kamal. Kamal, you'd like to okay. comment on I'd that? Say, I, I say, uh, Shri Ganesh, I saw your technique and I, it, it's wonderful, very innovative. Especially, I like the way you give a reference of a birth canal or probably even a cartridge. Cartridge, you know, it starts with a bigger bevel, a bigger funnel, and ends down slower. My only submission would be you know, Acrisoft, though being a hydrophobic lens, is a very, very malleable lens. Uh, this thing, at least in my opinion, would not work with a lens like uh, Envista. I, you can't get away with a 2.8 millimeter wound with Envista because Envista has got super sharp edges, number one. And I feel for those kind of lenses, I, because I do a lot of Envistas, I need at least a 3.4 millimeter outer port to get that lens out, number one. Number two, hydrophilics definitely would be a far more easier walk with this trapezoid. Uh, technique, but even if you go for a technis, anything beyond 23, 24 diopters can be tricky with technis because the technis has an optic haptic junction which is thinner. So sometimes for a beginner, I think we need to put a caveat there that when you're pulling it out, it can break. But yes, this is a beautiful technique. It doesn't distort the wound. One uh, parting word would be that the last part as it's coming out. Mentally, we have to make sure that we don't pull it upwards because that's the time the lens starts tipping in and starts touching the posterior capsule. It has to come out at the plane of the iris. If that is kept in mind, I think uh, it will work most of the cases. Wonderful day. The, no, the no. problem is uh, that you don't explain a lot of lenses. So I would, I would love to explain an Invista. I would love to explain a Technis one. But the thing is, you don't have so many cases to explain. So over a period of time, probably I will collect and then I have a collection. The first case was Envista, no? The first case was Envista. That's when he cut it. That's when he cut it. That was Envista. That I cut it. I cut it through and through. Through. I saw that. I use a lot of Envista, so I know taking out Envista is a little different ballgame. Kamal, you have taken out hundreds of Envistas? No, not hundreds of them, but yes, whenever I need to take them out, they're tricky. They're tricky. Okay. Yeah. Dr. Mohan, I wanted to add a couple of points. You know, I enjoy doing a couple of things. One is that uh, for all our beginner surgeons or even for uh, most of us, I think uh, coating with biscoat or something similar for protecting the cornea and also having making sure that the chamber is nice and deep and formed. These are two important things. And then, uh, you know, off late last few years, I like to inject my new lens into the bag uh, before I actually do any maneuvers with the, if it is possible. I mean, it may not be possible in every case. And Sri Ganesh showed an amazing technique. I'm going to try it next time. It really looks really cool. But uh, for, for now, my current uh, preference is to use the, and I have no financial interest, I use the MST uh, forceps, micro forceps and the MST micro scissors. The advantage is that you can go in from uh, paracentesis with both instruments and very controlled way, the forceps holds the optic very nicely and you can cut across it in a very, very controlled way. The instruments are amazing and, you know, uh, I, I feel that the, my investment is well worth it. I've been using <coughs> them for the last three, four years. They've not gone bad after, you know, maybe 10, 15 lenses yeah. that I've cut. And the se the so second think, case I showed was with the MST. Uh, right. So the advantages, also, uh, the advantages. Also, yeah, I just want to have, uh, before you go to this thing, you don't have to cut through and through. You, you, you don't just have to. Cut yes. three fourths and then you can go. Uh, you it can just come out. You just dial it out. 3.5 yes. millimeter hand-on-hand -hand technique. You can Absolutely. probably take it out. Absolutely. You don't need to cut it through and through. You leave a yeah. small connection and it just comes out. So the other thing I feel is that, um, you know, people, uh, sometimes I've seen people struggle with vanas and, you know, going through the main incision and, you know, trying to cut across the lens. I think that's not a great idea. And I'm sure some of the Indian manufacturers make equally good instruments like yeah. MST for, you know, the micro scissors and everything. And uh, we can easily, you know, look for one and make sure that we use micro instruments. I think these are my few takes, but uh, Sri Ganesh did a great job. Yeah.
Very nice. Thank you, Gaurav. Very Gaurav, you nice. should you should try it next time. Then you will throw away. I'll, I'll do that. Yeah, I didn't know, I didn't know she can have a good gynecologist as well. Mohan, <laughs> <laughs> can I say something? He knows the anatomy in and out. <laughs> More obstetrician, not gynecologist, obstetrician. Obstetrician, no matter what it is. Obstetrician and gynecologist. <laughs> Both. <laughs> Yeah, we go Mohan. on to the. Uh, uh, Mohan, any other comments from any other? Jo- George wants to say something, Mohan. Yes, yeah, George. Um, so I think you know your point about using the L-shaped incision as a backup is a very good one, and I think people should keep that in mind that they can do that. Um, the other point that I would have for Kamal is, you know, if you use warm BSS. It actually helps to fold the Invista and it helps to fold the technus material. So just taking your BSS and putting it in the blanket warmer and putting it in makes those lenses more pliable. Excellent tip, George. Yeah, wonderful. So I have a question to ask. Uh, I hope I'm audible here. Yeah. Yes. Uh, Professor Sigan, that was a great video. And you know, all these COVID times, apart from ophthalmology, we are taking help from you for keeping fit. Uh, <laughs> But with all these surgeries, I must have wasted so many micro forceps because they lose their memory when you start holding these thick optic haptic junctions and optics. So, but you know, it's a it's, it's a serious burn on yourself when you spend so much money. And I've used across the spectrum from Indo German to ICO to Epsilon. So, what is the forceps that you are using to pull these, you know, IOLs so strongly and still the, the you know the uh, the forcep doesn't do the, the, the trick is to hold it. No, no, no. This is the MST forceps. MST. But the trick is that, yeah, the trick is that you hold with your left hand. I'm holding a Macpherson, so I'm holding uh, the haptic with the Macpherson. So I'm exerting the pressure. See, the the MST basically, which you're using in your right hand, is used to twist the lens and fold the lens more than exert the pulling force. The pulling force is exerted by the, your Macpherson, which is holding the haptic. So there are two forces: one with the Macpherson, which is holding the haptic, and the other you also twist and also pull. So mm. when you're pulling, you pull with both hands. And that is the trick. And so that's when you don't damage your forceps. Thank Very you. Nice. I think um, we, uh, for a lot of time, I think we uh, quickly go on to the next presenter. I got a message from Dr. Namrata Sharma. Yeah, Namrata, she's coming. Yeah, I know. I, I I'm can there. see that. Hi. Welcome, Namrata. Hi, and Dr. Dr. Namrata. Have you, Namrata. And Sorry. I would like to introduce uh, Professor Namrata again. She's a professor at the RP Center. Uh, as you all know, she doesn't require any introduction. And she is also the secretary, a dynamic secretary of the All India Ophthalmological Society. And both uh, she and uh, Maipal are doing wonderful work in this challenging times of COVID. Thank you, Namrata, for joining us and um, uh, and sharing your expertise and knowledge with us as well. So if we go on to the next speaker. The next speaker is uh, is actually a Bollywood star. <laughs> Next speaker is Mohan Rajana. I know, that's what I thought. <laughs> <laughs> Only he can be a Bollywood star. Bollywood star. Dr. Himanshu. Uh, Himanshu Mehta, is, he's a very, very prolific uh, cataract uh, and refractive surgeon and director of the Vision Eye Center in Bombay, Leelawati Hospital, Nanavati Hospital, incoming president of the IRSI. And um, why I said a Bollywood star? With all the Bollywood uh, uh, actors are his patients including Amitabh Bachchan, Shah Rukh Khan, Amir Khan, everybody. And uh, even um, uh, Aishwarya Rai, all the uh, uh, all the top people in Bollywood are uh, uh, Himanshu's patients. And uh, Himanshu is a fantastic surgeon as well. And he's going to talk to us on a very, very important topic today. Himanshu, all yours. Thank you so much, Mohan, for the introductions. Good evening to everyone. Uh, we have had some very interesting session. I wanted to represent, I'll share the screen now, on suspended the IOL back complex, which has got subluxated. And that that is something which we are going to see quite often, regularly. As more and more patients who have been coming to us with uh, pupillary block and you have other problems, you will see gradually that they have the IOL back complex, which is kind of subluxated, dislocated into the vitreous. It's important how we can salvage this without getting the complex out because the moment we touch it and we try and pull it out, we will pull the vitreous, we will pull the zonules, we can create a detachment and we can do everything. So the important thing is that how with minimum manipulation can we go ahead. 
So any trauma, pseudo-exfoliation is one of the commonest causes, connective tissue disorders, inflammatory diseases. And you can see that these are patients who have a higher chances and posterior dislocation of an IOL. As you can see, all of us have been facing them in the last couple of years more than what we have ever faced in the past. So the posterior capsular rupture, the zonular dialysis is present. Most important, the zonular dialysis is because of the improper fixation within the capsular bag. Now, patients have any of these conditions should be followed carefully. And if one notes significant constriction, if you feel there is a phimosis, how can we avoid this? If you feel that the phimosis is happening very strongly, you can yag the anterior capsule. So the pull on the zonules will be less. Now, here is a case classically where you can see a subluxated IOL. It's moving around. And if you can see what I'm doing, I'm trying to first... One second. Yeah, so as you can see, the IOL is there and I am trying to, sorry, sorry. Uh, just play it, just play it. That's yeah, all. yeah, yeah. I wanted to pause it to show you that I'm trying to remove the adhesions between the iris repositor. With the iris repositor, I'm removing the adhesion between the IOL and the capsular bag. Once you remove that, you've made place for a future thing that you're going to be doing. Once you've done that, you measure the opposite three and nine or whichever place the subluxation is there. You mark the two angles which are there. You can either create a flap, scleral flap, or you can make a small groove in the sclera, as you can see here, which you can be, where the sutures can be hidden in the end. Now, what you're doing over here is with this side, you are planning to, you are passing a needle. And as, as you see, as you move forward ahead, three millimeters behind, you are passing a 26 number needle which is now 24 grade needle or a 26 you can hold the it stabilizes your sclera and this needle is passing between the iol back complex from behind and near the haptic optic junction from the lower edge and the 10-0 proline is being passed from the opposite side you already kept it pending over there so that you are ready for your next move and as you move ahead you hold it here is a very important step very important to so that you are giving counter traction with something we could have a forceps and or i'm using the dialer to give a counter traction on the iol back complex near the anterior capsule the uh, capsular excess area and the needle penetrates through very well because there is fibrotic element you have to be very careful that you do not subluxate the lens at this point in time once that is there now you have it's becoming a lot more easier you you see the needle which has penetrated the I will back complex from underneath and it's coming from underneath and coming above the lens. So it's holding the capsule, the up, the haptic and it's coming about the optic over the rexis margin and a 10-0 proline or a 9-0 proline, which is now being engaged into it and railroading. So as you, as you railroad it, you can take it out from that four millimeter behind. And that's now is a very important step, which has done. And you, you can see that the I will back complex, the schematic as you are going through you're passing the needle and you are holding it once that is done comes the second part the easier part the needle comes back now half a millimeter one millimeter in front of it in front of the lens above the iol back complex this is not holding anything so you're making a, a u-shape and the second part of the needle the second needle yeah. is being get getting into the uh, 26 number needle 24 gate needle and you are railroading it. And now you have two parts of the loop which are being pulled onto. Now see the important part here. You're not touching the cornea. You're not touching the vitreous. You're not touching the retina. You're not doing any fluidics. So the cornea is fairly simple. You're not creating too much of iris pigment problems. You're not touching the vitreous. You're not going to be creating a lot of traction on the vitreous base to avoid a detachment. And at the same time, smooth manipulation in a closed chamber you can go ahead and remove the second part now as you can see the second part comes out there and that's pulling the whole cord the bag on one side now repeat the same procedure on the opposite side as you can see that 24 gauge needle is going from this side you're giving counter traction from here and a similar procedure being followed because you have to have a traction and you're passing the 24 the 90 proline into the 24 gauge needle and one underneath as i said near the iol back complex with the haptic and the other one above and now you can see this is how the eye looks within 48 hours 
Uh, there is not much of iritis. There is hardly any fluidic. You have kept, if at all, there is vitreous in front of the lens. It's not, it's very simple to do a little amount of vitrectomy. The lens is still very strongly adhering there, and you have to be very gentle in manipulating since it's a closed chamber. You're not expecting vitreous to come out. You're not expecting the chamber to leak out very badly. And with some amount of viscoelastic, you can get away and close the wound. So even if you have a flap, you can suture it in the flap underneath the flap or a scleral groove with a conjunctiva on top of which will hide your proline sutures. Now, in, now this, is, this is just to repeat again. There is a second case. You know, if here is a patient who also had some amount of cortex left. So it's very simple that you can go ahead and remove the cortex. And the same way, you are railroading now, as I said, you're past the 10-0, you're ready for your next move. You're going from behind, four millimeters, you are, you're just holding on to that. You're railroading that needle into here. Underneath the IOL back complex with the haptic in, in place and now the upper edge. And this is how we can finish the, and that's, that's what can be done. So this is, this is what I wanted to talk about. Very good. Very nice, uh, wonderful videos, Himanshu. And uh, yeah, I think you are given the technique so beautifully. Only thing is, uh, what I will do differently will do, I will create Hoffman's pockets. I don't take a scleral flap, I don't open the conjunctiva. I just create Hoffman's pockets on both sides. It makes life much more easier, less messy as well. And uh, you said you go three millimeters from the limbus? Yes, three millimeters from the limbus. Yeah, well, well, you use nine zero or a ten zero? No, uh, a nine zero proline, but I'm okay. I'm I'm stabilizing the globe with a twenty four gauge needle, which is bent by itself. Okay, you are passing a twenty four gauge needle from one not side a, on one side on one side, and ah. I'm railroading from the opposite side with a nine zero proline. Why not a twenty six? Ah, yeah, that's right. I was stabilizing the globe because there was still movement in this case. As I said, that's why I was telling you between 24, 26, if you have a smooth eye, if it's, it, it's got good amount of sedation there and the eye is not moving, you can go ahead with the 26 number needle. Yes, you're right. Okay. Um, let me go on to the panelists quickly. Namrata, how differently you would have handled this particular problem? I think it was very elegantly done by Dr. Imanshu Mehta. And of course, it's a different way of doing it. And I think uh, he showed very nicely how you have to stabilize the lens with your dialer when you are actually putting the needle there to give a counter traction. That was a good part to show. But I think I would agree with you on one matter. And maybe because now I have seen it, I might change my strategy. But Hoffman's pocket, I would also put if, if I had seen the case in the first instance. But I think very nicely. Uh, uh, very nice, nice technique. Uh, I just yeah, wanted to reiterate one. Yeah. Yeah, this is minimum amount of fluidic. So the cornea is not very badly affected. The iris is safe. The vitreous base is safe. Yeah. And you're fairly confident that you not pulled any vitreous behind. So I have any traction of the vitreous base. Mm -hmm. yeah. Very nice. Very nice technique. And Maipal, you'd like to have uh, some other view on this. How do you manage this uh, uh, late yeah, resolution or subluxation? Uh, uh, you are not audible. Not audible, my part. that uh, well, uh, I would normally do it under a variable block. Well, uh, uh, am I audible now? Yeah. Yes, better. Am it's I audible now? Yeah. Okay. Yes, so yes, my the only thing. Yeah, the only thing I was saying was that I would prefer to do it under a variable block, and uh, therefore.
फोकल पीस लेंस एंड इफ इट डज गो बैक एंड सप्लक्सेट्स और डिस्लोकेट्स देन यू हैव टू हैंडल इट एट दैट पर्टिकुलर टाइम अकॉर्डिंगली बट माय पाल इफ यू पुट एन एंडो कैप्सुलर रिंग यस वुड इट नॉट बी वेरी डिफिकल्ट इफ द होल थिंग सप्लक्सेट्स आफ्टर दैट या एंडो रिमूविंग एन एंडो कैप्सुलर रिंग फ्रॉम द विट्रियस इज सो डिफिकल्ट नो नो बट इट्स इट्स नॉट इजी जोक so what you are trying to say is we are saying that maybe 2% 3% or 4% or i don't know the inst- uh, incidents but there is a limited number of cases of pseudo exfoliation where the entire back complex falls back so just uh, you can't make the exception as the rule because typically the endocapsular ring is giving a support in majority of the absolutely, case. absolutely. Yeah. yeah so yeah. They, the exception does not become a rule yeah absolutely quickly Can we I go have... up to uh, the other panelists gaurav Yes I think uh, Dr Himanshu did a great job because you know he made it so elegant there's little left to explain for this particular situation and then you know uh, I think uh, the discussion about the pseudo exfoliations uh, good idea to put in the endocapsular ring I would think and just a thought as Dr Maipal was speaking why not put a double sionis ring you know in case you are thinking that there's going to dislocate you'll have you know two eyelets available to you anyway but I mean it might take away some space in the back just a thought but i think i would have handled this particular case exactly as uh, dr himan should it and he did a great job and a very useful technique for uh, managing it hoffman's pocket was my point but you stole it from me so that's <laughs> that's okay <laughs> and that's my favorite for a few years and i think he did this case a couple of years back so probably today if he does it he will still use the hoffman he used a hoffman pocket yeah no problem i think that the key is to go make make sure that you pass one needle underneath the haptic the other one above the haptic am i right himan should Yeah, and you, that is you're, because you no, can you're have holding a loop. it. Yeah, you're, you're holding it. Yeah, you're, you're having a loop there. You're okay, Kamal. Loop. Yeah, yeah, Kamal, quickly. Uh, Kumar wants to say something. Kumar, go ahead. The Kumar. Yeah. What well, excellent Himanshu your presentation, but two three things. You know, these patients normally come with the histories that when they sit, they yeah. can't see, but when they lie down, they can see because the lens and the whole back complex comes in the middle. So when they are lying down, they can actually see the ceiling quite well. so very important thing is one is out of preferred to use a gotex material if possible and secondly another important thing would be that uh, very important when the patient lies down and you given a block make sure that you center the whole back complex and you get the same point so your uh, junction that you have selected to uh, make the loop around has to be exactly the same point on both sides if it is so, different on either side yeah. then it going to have cause a lens tilt and a new different issue altogether so it's very important that the patient lies down when we doing the surgery which we do and then of course we have blocked the patient but make sure that the points are marked so i would prefer to mark it and then make sure that the needle goes to the same point and you maintain the same angle yeah, of course often often is what you said it. this is just marked it in the beginning kumar uh, thank you yeah. yeah you always use the uh, ashwin agarwal marker you know 0180 so make sure that you are marking that very well before you start so kamal you have anything to say I have a point. Yes, I have a point. Okay, I guess Doctor Manchu, amazing surgery. Not audible. Think, uh, there was such a surgery. Uh, one query. Uh, sometimes, as Doctor Mahipal said, I agree with him totally. If the the subluxation is asymmetric, see, in your case, it was kind of symmetric. So you could probably go from one area, and when the suture was coming out from one. bang opposite you could go and catch the looping the other plate hapt, uh, other haptic from the similar area but in case you already made your two ports and the lens is actually now not exactly bang opposite the first suture is going from kamal your uh, voice is breaking haptic, kamal but the other one is not going from there so you may have a, okay we may have an asymmetric hammock effect It, it's that, not that, going that, from the similar places in the in the haptic area that, that's yeah. why i said you could have a tripod you 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 might have a yeah. third one to support you at a time like that you're right one, yeah another one, good idea one to one more point i'd like yes, to yes, add yes. is uh, we were discussing the pseudo exfoliation i agree with dr maipal in all my pseudo exfoliation cases i've started putting a ctr there are two benefits of a ctr of course you know it it, it, it stops the pressure of, of the zonules you know being number one number 2 when you put in a ctr and you go with the procedure like this you have a far more symmetrical support to go through when you go through the needle rather than just the haptic you have also the ring also supporting the whole capsular back so 
hundred percent agreeing with Dr. Maipal that putting in a CTR in these cases is a good idea because not all of them would go fall on the retina. And also, it's a good idea to use iris swoops and dilate the pupil because many of these pupils don't dilate. They not dilate. Well. Yes. Please understand Absolutely. they are all pseudo exfoliation. They don't dilate very well, and you need to know, make sure that you see the periphery very clearly when they are passing the needle up and down. So that's, I think, a good take home message. Nice video. We go on to the next. Uh, um, any questions from the audience, Kamal? I'm still getting a blank. There is a huge issue with the questionnaire. Just the same. Last question I get is, please, Dr. Mohan, keep planning more of such webinars. That's the last statement. I have. Uh, Kamal, I think you have to refresh it because I can see quite yeah. a few questions, but but you know most of them somebody has actually put in like 20 of the same messages. Any specular data on different techniques? So this is from Dr. Sanjeet Sa, and he's posted it about 20 times. And uh, so I don't know uh, what that uh, he wants I'm to know whether there's any specular data. I, I got a link from uh, uh, Ravi Shankar. From after this, you can take some questions. I'm and, uh, the, getting the link from Ravi Shankar. I'm getting the same question again and again. No problem. I will. Uh, I have the pleasure of introducing the speaker number six. You always hit sixes. That's the reason why I put him at six. Uh, six. <laughs> <laughs> because this guy is uh, really a fantastic surgeon from Bombay, director of the Dr. Rai Institute. And uh, he is a very dynamic cataract and uh, refractive surgeon, powerful speaker and a fantastic surgeon as well. And uh, he's very innovative and a lot of lateral thinking. Uh, he's always a pleasure. Every time in, in every conference, he always comes up with something very new. And I'm sure he'll have something new today as well. Over to Kumar Doctor. Mohan, why have you not introduced him as a Bollywood star? Because all uh, his patience is Himanshu has taken. <laughs> <laughs> he is an absolute star by himself. Look at himself, that picture. He himself is a star. He is a star by himself. He does. He is you know, taking the Bollywood patients. He is a Bollywood star himself. He is a star <laughs> himself. Absolutely. Uh, thank you, Mohan, and thank you, Amar, and the whole team of uh, the Implant Society. I'm going to show two different things. I, I mean, it's one case, but a discussion on this will be quite interesting. All of us see this now, okay? And we are all going to face this. So on the left side, you can see a uh, iris clip IOL. Some of us have done this. This was the varices, fakic IOL and a cataract inside. The right side is another fakic IOL. You also have the STAR ICL or the Indian ICL, the IPCL, the fakic IOL made by Biotech. Now the question is, if all these fakic IOLs come out with a cataract, what are we going to do and how do we handle this? So mm -hmm. foldable ICLs and they have a cataract, what next? non-foldable ICLs and they develop a cataract, what next? So what can we really do here? So this is a case of a, a foldable IOL, you can see, where it's very, quite simple. I've made an incision, uh, taking virion in, uh, into consideration and I've rotated the lens uh, vertically so that it can be removed. Now the incision was 2.2, I'm making it 3.2. Now this is an old star ICL done by me many, many years back. I'll show you a video at the end of it. And now I'm going to bring this ICL into action. So I'm opening the old ports, uh, making sure that there is viscoelastic supported, and then get the plates into the anterior chamber. And now I'm going to use the same forceps. And I'm putting viscoelastic below the ICL, supporting uh, the lens from below, and putting viscoelastic above the ICL that's protecting the endothelium. Once we've done this, now go in with the same star ICL forceps, which is to use the lens, which is used actually to uh, grip the uh, star ICL and then hold it and then pull it out. So here, the incision that I made was about 3.1 or 3.2. So you can see that I'm holding the ICL uh, and then getting it out. There was no central hole because this was done many, many years back. Once I've grasped it, it's just pull it out. And then one can go ahead with a routine cataract surgery and it's quite easy to manage. So here, of course, the incision was made with the Virion technology. So I made the incision at 90 degrees and then removed the uh, ICL with holding it. Here you can see that it's being held and then just pulled out. Now it's quite easy. You can see the wound well made. Do a CCC, go ahead and do your CCC, do your fake emulsification, then do biman, do IA, whatever method you want. Once you've done that, go ahead, uh, the bimanual IA, go ahead and put the IOL in the back. So this was quite easy. This will happen over the night. I'm going to show you the last part of this video where it shows that when did I do this uh, ICL many, many years back? And that's what I luckily hit. The patient had the data. This is just the bimanual IA and then put an endocapsule ring because I felt that the bag was not very good. Uh, these are high myopic patients, some discussion that we had on this part. Once I put that, go ahead and put the IOL in the bag. 
So now I'm going to do just remove the viscoelastic and the last part of this video is about the date and what I had done it. So you'll see that on 24th of July or June in 2002, this was done by me and you can see this 24th of July, uh, 2002 was the ICL when I had done this, uh, 2002, and it was a minus 22.5 uh, diopter star ICL. So that time they did not have a central hole and that's the reason why there was a little iridectomy on the side and you can see the diopter power. So this was as far as this goes, but now the question comes when you have a non-foldable fakic IOL in place, now what to do? Because these are non-foldable, you can't cut them in the eye, they are made of PMMA. Uh, this is a varicis IOL, so now I made a 2.2 millimeter incision, gone ahead and done a side port, and now the question is, I have to do FACO, I have to do IA, I have to remove this, and then put in another IOL. So if I'm going to do this before, uh, and remove the IPC, uh, remove the varicis IOL before, then my wound is going to be 5.1 millimeter, and that's not going to be enough. So what I've done here is made the main incision, gone ahead, uh, done my rexis. After doing the rexis, uh, you can see that I'm running parallel to the size of the optic, which is 5 millimeter in size, done my hydro dissection. Once I've done my hydro dissection, I'm going to go ahead and with FACO. So now I'm doing FACO below. The only care I've taken a little bit here is to reduce the bottle height. You can see the bottle height in the right corner is normally 106. I made it 54 centimeters. So that pushes in less fluid and that's a big advantage. Go ahead and do fake emulsification, remove the nucleus. Once I have done that, I make my second side pot and then I remove the uh, cortical material with bimanual IA. So you can see that I'm doing bimanual IA. Uh, once I have done that, uh, go ahead and then remove this varicis fake IOL, non foldable, 5 millimeter in size. So here I'm going to do bimanual IA, remove all the cortical material. Once I have done that, put in the viscoelastic, create your backspace, and then uh, disengage the claws of the iris. Uh, and the technique there is very, very simple. What I'm going to do is you will see here, just removing the cortical material now. Once I have done that, I'm going ahead, uh, making two side ports. Uh, you will see the side ports being made. Uh, these side ports has to be in the area where there is uh, the iris, which is enclaving the claw. Uh, once you've done that, uh, this is the side port that is being made exactly in the same area. So this is the same uh, needle that we or the spear that we use on the both the sides. Once I've done that, there is a special varicis forceps, which is actually a claw, uh, two behind and one in the front. And now I'm using the same port just to make sure that I'm holding on to the eye. This is all under topical anesthesia. And make now I'm going to enlarge my wound. And once I enlarge my wound, I'm going ahead and holding the varicis forceps. Uh, now you can see that I put an iris repositor. With the left hand, I'm holding the IOL and then pushing the claw towards me upwards and pushing the iris repositor downwards. That is to disengage the iris from the claw. So that's a one-step procedure, very easy to just disengage that. Once you've done that, do the same thing on the other side. You can see that I've removed the iris from the claw. Go ahead again, hold on the other side and now hold the claw. You can see this is a special varicis forceps which was given to us many, many years back. And now I'm disengaging the claw on the other side, remove the iris from there, and then rotate this lens because at that diameter it's 5.5 millimeters. So now I'm rotating the uh, fake IOL uh, and then removing it out from the eye, going ahead and putting a foldable IOL, uh, which is anyway, whichever lens the lens measurement is. And then I like to take sutures in such cases because that will take care of the astigmatism calculation which will be necessary at that stage and then do a bimanual IA and remove the viscoelastic. So the take-home message here is if you're foldable or non-foldable, if it is foldable, you really don't need to worry about the calculation of the ICL. Foldable is a small incision, it can just be removed, a good tunnel and same forcep to grab the ICL will remove that. As far as the non-foldable, I thought that we do fake emulsification and irrigation aspiration underneath the ICL, then remove the ICL, that's the non-foldable, the iris claw varices, and then we can go ahead, just care, as I mentioned, was to reduce the bottle height, go ahead and put another foldable IOL, and then at the end, I would like to take a suture so that it prevents the astigmatism and the calculation that was done. Uh, thank you all and thank you, Mohan and Amar thank and you. Laura and I think this. it was a, a brilliant, brilliant presentation as usual. Kumar, I like your glasses as well. It's a night vision glasses. What <laughs> <are> you <laughs> anyway, but the first case, I want to, before we go on to the panelists, the first case, you enlarge the incision to about 3.2. 3.1, 3.2, yeah. 3.1, 3.2. Because I could see some iris coming out uh, 
uh, during yes, your yes 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 so yes. I was wondering whether you can it's possible to uh, enlarge uh, uh, remove these lenses with 2.8 uh, uh, it should be possible yes possible to be possible yeah it's possible the second case normally when you have a iris claw lens in the eye okay um i find your technique is also very good you have shown that you are underneath the iris claw lens but what is the impact on the corneal endothelium because you are pushing this uh, varices lens forward during a phaco emulsification number 1 i always put a sterile incision and try to remove the iris claw lens and then probably put one suture and then go temporal clear corneal then do the phaco and come out uh so that's my way of doing it but let let us ask the panelists maybe many ways to skin the cat maypal what's your take on that yeah so basically uh, mohan i would agree with you that uh, there is no harm in doing a slightly posterior limber or a scleral incision putting a suture and taking another incision and doing the rest of the surgery i don't know kumar completed the entire surgery he should have also gone ahead and put the intraocular lens and taken out the varices after that <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> makes sense makes sense I think uh, Kumar, you had uh, done it. Uh, you had not used femto. I think we published a similar case with a varicose lens, but we used femto to make the rectus and also to make our chops. So you know that kind of still eases out your surgery. But the, yes, uh, and we had also disenclavated from one side. But that endothelial uh, cell loss problem is there because it it may rub onto the uh, onto the cornea. So what you need to do is keep pushing it in viscoelastic. uh maybe a visco dispersive type so that you know your endothelium remains protected but yeah, we that, published that, that, this case only apprehension i had uh, manamrata you read yeah. maypal you wanted to say something so, yeah i wanted so first of all uh, uh, kumar i would rather remove the lens first and uh, obviously do a specular before doing that because a lot of these cases would have a poor specular count uh the second thing uh, is that uh, what uh, dr namrata mentioned was about the femto uh sometimes the femto recognizes the lens as the capsule so you have to be very very careful about that because you can have a cut uh, uh, that was shown by dr ramamurthy and i have also at times you may not be able to get a good uh, capsule or excess uh, that is there with a femto when you have an icl in place uh the first case that you said i do not prefer to use this thick uh, beat for uh, stuff because you'll need to have a larger incision all you need to remove uh, uh, an icl is to put viscoelastic uh, just uh, levitate out the ends and just bring out one uh, plate uh, the uh, haptic edge from one plate and bring it out and uh, i normally use two capsular excess forceps or the other forceps uh, a macpherson usually slips but if you have a capsular excess two forceps you can do easily a hand over hand technique uh, like what uh, 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 shri had shown you or you could i no nowadays i have also started using the smile forceps uh the smile forceps has also gives you a very good hold on the icl and you don't really need to extend it at all beyond 2.8 mm so these any of these forceps which gives you a good you just need to take out one edge of the plate and uh, you can easily pull it out so i won't go in with a thick beak uh, uh, forceps because i think that is the reason why you actually were struggling to put it uh, below the uh, icl and you possibly needed to enlarge the incision you can very easily manage it through 2.8 Uh, obviously you are a surgeon and you can uh, do these things but these are small two variations that i will have from uh, what you showed i think beautiful message uh, my pal and uh, go to kamal and gaurav yeah uh, i think uh, kumar as usual a phenomenal surgeon and a phenomenal surgery uh, just one or two points uh, uh, according to the the surgeries we saw in the first case uh, where you were about you're taking out a foldable phacic lens I agree with Dr. Maypal. You don't need to enlarge the wound, probably because of the forceps or the technique you were using. You probably needed to enlarge the wound. What I do is I push in the viscoelastic. Since if I'm making a fresh wound, I make a tunnel which is probably 0.25 millimeters smaller. Then all I need to do is the leading haptic of the fakey lens, which is supposed to come out, that I de-enclavate, and then I push my scleral lip as my viscoelastic comes out. i invariably get one or two edges of the knob coming into my wound then all i need to do is go in and hold it with mac first and it comes out works every time it works number 1 number 2 in the second case where you operated uh, you know i don't have an experience of doing that but i've done a lot of cases of fake foldable lenses did a complete fake o rexis everything underneath that i think I, you might have seen those videos 
where I've done everything underneath the fakic lens and then explanted the fakic lens because the two of these cases were very high myopes with very low scleral rigidity. And I had used V1 model of the IPCL, which was far more rigid and it required a 3.2 millimeter uh, incision to be uh, removed. The v, V2 requires 2.8. But then it works, but yes, Dr. Mon Rajan is right. It can cause endothelial damage. So the tip which I did use in those cases was I used frozen HPMC on top of the fakie lens. And then I started doing my irrigation aspiration. And after every few minutes, I would push in some amount of, you know, cold chilled uh, methyl cellulose on top to coat the endothelium. Why I use a cold chilled endothelium uh, to cover the endothelium is because it's far more viscous doesn't come out easily and it coats the endothelium very beautifully and it works every time. So these are all two small little tips I have. I think uh, one important message Maipal has told is do a specular for all these patients Absolutely. with uh, True. iris claw lenses and uh, varices lenses. Very important before you take this patient up for um, the FACO and explantation oh. as well. Now, Gaurav, uh, yes, uh, I, I, I think... Uh, yes, George, go ahead. Yeah. George. Uh, can I just share my screen for a second? Yes, 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 L-shaped. I, I was just wondering if there's any evidence to say that chilled HPMC or chilled viscoelastic is going to cause less endothelial damage. No, it's not about the endothelial damage, Dr. Namrata. I, I was very clear. It's far more viscous. It doesn't come out easily. Just try it. Try pushing out a chilled viscoelastic through the syringe. It's far more hard to push. You can use viscoat, no, for that. Yes, you can, but in case you, this is a tip for all the other beginners, you can use a little bit frozen HPMC, it's far more whisker, it doesn't leak out easily. Yeah, I, go ahead. Guys, do you see it? Yes, 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 yes. Okay, so this is the L shaped incision. Originally, when we did this 20 years ago, was when we started doing the artisan or the varicized lenses. And if you make that incision and then do this tunneling, it allows you to take those lenses out without using any sutures and not inducing any astigmatism. So it's this three by three and then by six, and you can take the complex out, but you can also take out those varicized lenses or artisan lenses through that incision. So I just wanted to show that to Beautiful. the- Beautiful. Uh, very, very innovative, uh, George. We, I've seen these videos and um, in all the conferences, really fantastic uh, innovation. And uh, Gaurav, you have something to add? Yes. You know, I think everybody has already said everything, but uh, there was only one thing which I wanted to add that sometimes if you're using a very small incision, like I use a 2.2 incision and to remove the ICL, you need at least a 2.8. So, uh, you know, what you could do is that, uh, and sometimes you make a 2.8, by the time the ICL is out, it actually becomes a three or bigger. And so sometimes you'll have a leaky wound, uh, just like Kumar got a little bit of iris prolapse. You can abandon that incision and make another small 2.2 right. incision and just use that. You don't have to suture this one because it will be sutureless. So that's another, you know, like a rescue thing that, you know, you don't necessarily have to go through an incision which is slightly bigger. You can just, you know, make, change your uh, main incision and complete the FACO from another incision as well. But I think all the other tips were all great and uh, and Kumar showed some excellent videos. Yeah. Yeah. I think... One, I just want to say one thing uh, that one is, of course, I've done specular for these cases and they've done very well. The second point I want to make is I always use visco to protect the endothelium. And if you see during the surgery and during FACO and IA, the lens is quite steady. The iris mm -hmm. lens is not very volatile. You don't lose your chamber. The only reason being my bottle height was low. So if you maintain the bottle height a little lower, you're not pushing in too much fluid. Your iris is not going to balloon up and your iris lens is not going to come up. So that is going to protect itself. So if you saw the video, the lens was quite stable. It was hardly going up and down, up and down. It is, it, there's no volatility in the chamber at all. So this is just one uh, take home yeah. trick that I did. And I've done both eyes and the patient's doing it. Oh, I understand, I understand. But the problem in high myopes as well is that the fluid misdirection can happen. And uh, yes. they can go underneath the iris and push the iris forward. And if it's going to push the iris forward, the lens is also going to go forward and hit the endothelium. Mohan, so uh, just, one just one yeah, comment. Just one comment. Uh, you come back? Yeah, Kumar, yeah, Kumar uh, excellent uh, video. And I think uh, this technique has been published where uh, this is the preferred me uh, method for the varicized lens. And it's better to do FACO than remove the lens. Because if you remove the lens through a large incision, then you can't maintain the fluidics. So that's a very important point that you, you can do the FACO with the lens. And then later on, you remove the lens Absolutely. once you've finished it. And of course, if you combine it with the L-shaped incision, then there's no need to suture also. And uh, the publication says that the endothelial damage is less with this technique because if you put viscote between the corneal endothelium and the 
uh, uh, the very size, the then the lens does not move up. And then yeah. even your uh, uh, fluid currents and the lens does not touch the endothelium. The endothelium is actually like a shield for the endothelium. And it's it's already published. This uh, this is their... Uh, yeah. Yeah. So, we, so they have all, already done specular uh, microscopy we, and found we, that we the endothelial damage is not much. We published a couple of cases of uh, this type in Journal of Refractive Surgery. But with the varicize, we used Femto also. So we used but, Femto to make the rexes, Femto to make I've the I've seen chocolate. that publication. Uh, yeah. but, uh, but, but another important aspect is not to disenclavate the haptic. Because if you disenclavate the haptic, then the lens mm-hmm. tends to move. So you should not disenclavate the haptic. Complete the FACO like Kumar showed. Uh, and excellent video, Kumar. Very nice, very innovative. Namrata, you have any change? Um, you do you change any um, settings for the femto when you are doing? Uh, you have the, to because you have to offset it yeah. a little bit. Offset. Because yeah. you have to put it, it on the capsule, so you have to. So, like ICL may, you know, uh, may may itself get cut with the femto. That it will not happen with very size. Fine. Thanks a lot, and we go on to the next speaker. Since we are running short of time, there. So the next speaker is. Uh, actually doesn't require any introduction at all uh, because she's so famous. Dr. Somashila Murthy, and she's uh, from LVPI, Hyderabad, as you all know, she's also the member scientific committee in the AOS now. She's the head of the cornea and the anterior segment. And Somashila is the most popular consultant in LV Prasad, according to all our students. And she's a very she's a mentor for many, and she's a guide for many, and she's also a friend and a philosopher and guide for many. And uh, Somashila is a very dynamic cornea, cataract, and refractive surgeon. We have seen her in surgical strikes in Chennai quite often, and every year she comes and demonstrates some lovely surgery, small pupils, fakey kaivals, and all that. So over to Dr. Somashila for her uh, uh, slightly different video. Somashila, all yours. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mohan Rajan. I'm just about to share my screen. Yeah. And first of all, when you said that very popular, so I thought it wasn't me and I was relaxing again. <laughs> so, <laughs> and uh, very, very generous introduction. Uh, thank you. You've not met my students who don't like me also. <laughs> I'm sure there are many of them. Uh, but it's it's been wonderful. I think this is the first time, as I was telling Gaurav, that I'm participating in this particular for, forum. And uh, I'm going to uh, bat from a different wicket. So, so my one case, one pearl is going to be on refractive surgery. And I'm going to discuss a uh, femtoflap complication. It's not so much as one pearl from this, but probably it's a difference in opinion or difference in management that many of us would have when you come across, it can happen to anyone, a complication like this. So let me roll in the story of, a, of a, on a beautiful day, a 32-year-old software engineer decides to come in for refractive surgery and uh, we had tested him before. His visual equities were improving. This was his refraction with minus seven. I'm not able to see your video. Uh, I'm not yet started the video. I'm just oh, I'm sorry. Okay. In the text at this point. And this was his refractive correction for the right eye and left eye. Nothing very out of the ordinary. And so we, uh, we, so I, I, we shared your screen? I have shared my screen. Is I'm it sorry. Me? Okay. Sorry. Sorry. Maybe there's some lag. Can you see my screen? It shows you that there's a 32-year-old software engineer. Yeah, there's nothing. No, no, nothing is seen. That is the reason why I'm telling you. Nothing is seen. Your screen is not working. I'm seeing only your beautiful face. Okay. That's not enough. Mm-hmm. You have to share your screen. Just share your screen and... Uh, yeah, I'll try again. So... Yeah, that's right. Better okay. now. Yeah, you're able to see now. Yeah. yeah. Can start Sorry, from the uh, beginning. Yes. So this is about a case of refractive surgery since everybody are such masters at cataract surgery. I knew I couldn't do better than them. So I decided to shift gears and I'm going to talk about a case of a femtoflap complication. Uh, This is not so much as a single pearl, but more to probably discuss what are the various kinds of management that others would do in this particular case. And this is the kind of management we did for our case, who's this uh, very nice, pleasant 32 year old software engineer. His refractive correction for the right eye was minus two cylinder and minus seven spherical and left eye was 6.75 with a 0.75 cylinder. And he did have uh, extensive lattices in his retina, which he underwent laser for that and, and everything done. So he came in for surgery and of course he had to go overseas and things like that. So already time was running and he wanted everything done perfectly. 
uh, his corneal topography is just to show that it was it's just so green and pleasant to look everything was good about the topography there's no danger over there so this is a surgical video uh, the patient did have in retrospect uh, we thought what could be the factors he did have deep set sockets and slightly prominent brow and a large nose but it was a very cooperative patient and so this was the first eye that uh, these although the patient did move a little bit while the femto laser was going on we don't unfortunately we don't have a recording of that but we could see the raster yeah. going very well in place at no point was suction lost so the surgeon was very confident that the flap would have been dissected as per plan and nothing is amiss so the surgeon is going in and just opening up the flap as usual and it's a little sticky but uh, the surgeon is very confident that everything will be fine you can notice that there's some subcutaneous hemorrhage over here and the the eye is a little deeper deep set socket so as a surgeon dissects out the flap from superior part and goes inferiorly suddenly what he notices is that there's a tear and actually it's not just a tear he first thought there's a tear but it's not just a tear what has happened is that there's a whole segment inferiorly that has not been dissected at all by the femto laser so there is a point in the lasik flap where there is no dissection at all so the surgeon is now not panicking just trying to explore and see whether it it is dissected but it is separate it's a separate piece but no doesn't very correctly doesn't fiddle with it anymore and now has just lifted this and is still thinking about what to do next so he immediately tells the patient that uh, there is a slight problem with your flap in your right eye but i think that there are two choices we can either proceed or or we can stop and what would you like me to do so sort of with an educated patient you can do that and the patient consented he said that go ahead i trust you doctor so if you notice that the central pupil is is still is right here and there's an adequate space even below, below it perhaps you have a 6 mm optic zone so the surgeon went ahead and completed the laser without any problem as far as just firing the laser was concerned the surgeon then comes back and is going to deposit deposit the flap back into place so it's just moistening both ends of the flap and puts it back into place so that was not very difficult actually so what the surgeon is doing and this is um, i've edited it but took a good 7 minutes to complete this part of it first simply just put it back in place and saw that this particular edge is going to roll up if that's all the surgeon does so the surgeon pushes that little edge back so want to wants to seal this completely at no point do we want the epithelium to be rolled outward and so this is done multiple times till the, the surgeon is very very satisfied that the entire uh, anterior surface is looking like a single unit so again another wash is given and again the inferior area is explored to make sure that the surface is very smooth and it's almost in continuity that there's a single kind of plane in continuity once again the tissue is put back into place making sure that the epithelium is not rolled outwards so in the very end uh, we placed a bcl on the eye and uh, the routine post operative medication was started for the patient the left eye was uneventful uneventful there was no problem there at all so this is the placement of the bcl so what happens on the first post op day the patient was very comfortable but his visual acuity in the right eye was not as clear as the left eye and he was 20 30 and what we could see on the slit lamp photograph is these epithelial cells but they were not really in the interface if you can see here a slightly brighter uh, curvilinear line that was the edge of the area which had broken through or cut through and their epithelial cells but this was below the bcl and because when you remove the bcl at one week uh, these cells were no longer there nothing was there so so just to go through his follow up visits at one week he was about 20 40 at three weeks he actually improved he was 20 20 again at two months he started complaining of colored halos in his right eye and his visual acuity now started bringing in a cylinder in the right eye but five months when he came in and uh, uh, he he said that his halo had decreased we had started him on brimonidine for his halos and his visual acuity at five months was about 20 25 with a 0.25 spherical and a 0.5 cylinder and uh, just to uh, sort of take care of this small amount of myopia we kept him on timolol eye drops and of course lubricants so this is the oct at one week and what i want you to look at is the edge so here you have a very nice routine kind of lasik flap coming in 
and this is already one week after the lens is out. So the inferior part actually has a dissection plane, but it was at a different level. So the level was not the same. And this must have happened because the patient did move his eye, but we never lost suction at any point. So the, the laser continued to do the dissection, but at two different levels. So it's a good thing that the surgeon didn't try to dissect out this plane with, with sharp dissection. And then at one month itself, if you take a cut through the vertical aspect, you can see that everything, you know, you can't really make out what's happening. It'll be very hard pressed to say that this patient had really had any problem at all. So we had a very good outcome for this patient. This is his topographic map. The anterior surface shows a very good smooth kind of map, which is comparable with the other eye. So that was about my case. I'll stop sharing nice. my screen. Yeah, very nice uh, demonstration of that uh, complication, flap complication, Somashila. I just want to know, you did the right eye first and then went to the left eye. Right. Okay. And what was the problem of incomplete? What is the reason for the incomplete flap in the right eye, number one? Okay. Number two is, since you had a complication of an incomplete flap in the right eye, you do not know what exactly is the reason. Does it make sense to go for the left eye? So the surgeon here has, so we all have a typical practices. So, so my practice is to do femto laser on one eye, then complete the eczema laser part, and then go on to the next eye do the femto flap and then complete the eczema part. But the surgeon here finished the flaps on both the eyes. So he had already got the femto flap in the left eye as well. And then the, the table was flipped to the eczema laser. And then he brought in the right eye and started doing, started dissecting the flap and was ready to do with the eczema laser. Okay. So that's At the time only he realized. That is when he realized, yeah. The oh, other right. eye flap was already done. And even at the time of the femto flap, uh, when it was being created, there was really no hint to let us know that things could be amiss. Patients do move their eyes a little bit, but as long as you don't have suction loss, so you assume that, and then when you see the raster turns as normal as it usually is, so you assume that you're going to have a regular kind of a femto laser pattern for this patient as well. So there was really no hint or no clue uh, at that point to figure out that we're going to land into trouble with one eye. Okay. And of course, as you said, your second question was that, yeah. I, I guess you were alluding to when you know that there's a complication. So, yes, right. Yeah. So Why you should take up the second eye. That's the reason exactly, why. Yeah. So that's I didn't know the, that you had done flaps for both eyes. Yes. Yeah. So, so still we could just abandon and not do in, and wait, you know, put a BCL, not do anything and come back in later, probably go in with PRK, transepithelial. Uh, that would be an excellent option. Maybe we could have done the left eye. So these are... Uh, the, there are guidelines, of course, but the discussion in the patient should be involved in the discussion. And it, so this patient had a concern of traveling, going overseas. Of course, he came back probably because of the pandemic coming up. So he came back in March most recently, but otherwise he was due to go overseas for quite a while. And he was available to us for at least two to three months after the surgery in India. So we discussed with the patient and it seemed to be reasonable at that time to go ahead and complete the surgery. Okay. Uh, uh, thanks, uh, Somashila, for the nice points. Let me go on to the panelists. Um, Namrata, can you tell me what exactly has gone wrong in this case? I think uh, we need to see the raster pattern, I think, to be able to say that. That is something which is, uh, you know, important before you realize why that area was uncut or whether the patient has moved or was it really a superficial cut as opposed to the, to the cut which was being made. So I think that, uh, that surgical video is important to see. And I would not have one, uh, uh, you know, continued with the case and to not ask the patient also whether I should continue or not, because I think that decision rests with you rather than, you know, with the patient uh, and would have taken the case at a later date. Of course, it, it went off well uh, at the end of it. But there can be regular astigmatism in cases like this, which could be very difficult to, you know, tackle with colored hairpins and multiple other problems. So uh, it is a way of tackling. And I think that epithelial ingrowth, uh, I don't think comes at day one. I've not seen, I mean, others have seen, I don't know. It generally takes some time, you know, for the epithelial ingrowth to come, uh, uh, to come in the interface of a LASIK flap. You know, at least a month, for the epithelial yeah, cells. These, these were probably epithelial uh, cells, maybe. Just just every, yeah, yeah. every sort of a thing. Which is, yeah, that's right. Yeah. 
and mm -hmm. i think it is not a good practice to do two flaps together and then to examine laser because you have both the eyes with the drapes like that and then you know both the eyes are open and then do the flap of the one and then you know do the examiner it is best to complete one eye and then do the other i the think other. namrata for that you don't have a choice it depends on what uh, femtosecond laser you are using i was going to ask uh, somrachila that uh, uh, what uh, femtosecond laser you were using yeah we use the fs200 but in Just, but still in that you can actually do uh, you know complete the procedure both steps on one eye and then do the second procedure but right. like uh, i use an interlace and on the interlace you know because i have to I'm move choice. the patient from one one by one room to the other so mm -hmm. you have to do both femto flaps and then wait for some time for the obl to go away and then take them up both for so sometimes you don't have a choice but sometimes you do but obl that is not a problem with fs200 yeah. you have to wait for no, it's it. not it's not a, it's not a, it's not a problem but in the interlace because you know like i have a i have a wave light and okay, i have an interlace so you can't uh, kind of you know shuttle the patient twice but doing both eyes is, makes it much more simpler than you know shifting the patient i also have a fs200 and uh, doing an femto is a semi sterile procedure whereas when you are doing actually opening the flap you can drape the patient i don't uh, drape the patient okay. by doing yeah. femto the first part is done without draping yeah, without the draping the second part when you uh, then then you know you can flap and then you can zap you can do both flaps together yeah. and then you can come and, and we, zap we drape at both the instances whether yeah, yeah. Okay. So, so in fact, you know, Doctor Mohan, can I chip in with yeah, important? Uh, no, I want to ask uh, Kamal and Maipal. What do you yeah. think the reason uh, for this? Do you think the hollow sunken okay. eyeball is something to do with the complication there? That is what I was wanting to ask because I don't have any personal experience with FS two hundred, but majority of the almost all the femto uh, flaps that we have done, it is under direct visualization. So mm -hmm. I think the FS two hundred would also allow you to see the entire procedure of uh, where the raster beam is passing and things like that right it does yeah, it does so we can see yes. the entire raster pattern and so and it seems like uh, the problem is that uh, uh, under these circumstances there has to be either a vertical gas break through because even if there are two separate planes what you are trying to say it is not as thin the point is that absolutely absolutely it is not really that uh, uh, basically there might have been a small adhesion but you should be able to see a cold spot there were there any cold spots at that particular area uncut areas or any vertical break through that would have been seen well it should be visible uh, so that is one part of it so uh, without seeing the uh, uh, the femto part of it the video of it i will not be able to uh, comment at all as to why it has happened normally majority of the machines uh, once you lose suction they stop stop Yeah. So, so uh, here, yeah. So as uh, so the section was good. That's what you did said, no? So yeah. I'm sorry. So, so the couple of points here is unfortunately I apologize. I don't uh, have. Typically, yeah. even if there is a movement, the suction is strong enough for it to continue in the same plane. Until of course there is a pre-existing corneal opacity. I also have a video which I often show is that there was a nebular macular corneal opacity. Absolutely. Part and there I had a vertical gas breakthrough mm -hmm. bubble. i could see the burping of the gas and i could i knew that there is a vertical gas break through bubble and that is why there was a uncut area and when we were dissecting it didn't go well uh, into the same plane now uh, depending upon how peripheral is this uh, i would have a slightly different opinion from uh, what was said earlier is that the harm or the damage of an uneven flap has already been done Yes, as you are zapping it, or you are not zapping it, it is not going to make any difference in the epithelial incidence of the epithelial ingrowth because whatever damage had to be done because of the irregularity of the flap that has been done, as long as that is not impeding on the visual axis to cause a refractive effect. So uh, maybe this was slightly bigger, but if it had been a slightly smaller one, I would not have hesitated to do ahead and do that. The only thing that I might have manipulated is that I might have reduced the optic zone from six to five point five. Uh, so that the whole area where i am doing the eczema ablation becomes slightly okay. smaller uh, leaves that particular area but uh, yes i will put a contact lens uh, i may not put it for a week maybe 2 3 days is sufficient enough for it to handle and the only only thing that you have to take care is the epithelial ingrowth in such particular because the periphery uh, it's like you have created another hinge as i would wish to say uh, so that's uh, that would heal pretty well and the uh, results are pretty good so you have to evaluate before you are starting to lift the flap as to what went wrong so i don't have the video and you say that everything was fine so that is a little puzzling for me as to why this would have happened because i have not seen such kind of a thing or there was a pre existing corneal opacity which was missed 
So those are the only things which are there. So, so the case was handled. One question, my pal. Do you think yeah. you know the dissection, though it was at a different plane, if it had been yeah. done a little bit more gently, it could have uh, it it wouldn't this wouldn't have happened. I think it was. No. Yeah. I'll be I don't think so. Your on a slow <laughs> motion because I think it was a, a lift that went not in the plane but went up and uh, there was a. Area and he tore the flap actually. He or she, whoever has done that, yeah. uh, I think uh, that was the only thing. That, yeah, I, we'll try to, we'll still try to pull out the uh, the femto part of it. I don't have access to it. And I, uh, what was the flap thickness? So it's it was about it was 110, preset at 110. 110, 120, it doesn't seem yeah. to be a very thin 90 micron flap. <laughs> Can I add something? Yeah, Kamal, quickly and uh, because we okay. are running short of time. I, I yeah. think I would tend to agree with both Dr. Namrata and Dr. Maipal for a simple reason. Uh, if the triangle of the uncut tissue was larger, I would have not done the surgery. But as Dr. Maipal says, the damage is already done. In yes. case it was smaller, you could reduce the optical size, beautifully explained by Dr. Maipal. I've had two cases like that. The possible reason in those two cases when I went back and saw the files was there was a sheet of mucus under my uh, PI, patient to face, which did not, where the laser didn't go well. And it was being operated by one of my surgeons who was just new at femto surgery. And I was called to the theater. In one of the cases, since the triangle was large enough and it was not making any sense for me to reduce the thing, luckily I had a 90 micron flap. So I put the flap back and I went in to operate another day after some time, 30 microns deeper than that. Now, in the other case, since the triangle was small, what I did was I just dipped my mirror seal. Now, uh, people may have raised eyebrows to that. I dipped my mirror seal in alcohol. I just, at the edge, I touched it for a few seconds. I made sure I washed it away and then I peeled away the epithelium from there and I completed the surgery with a complete 6.8 millimeter optical zone and it worked fine. But the triangle of tissue was small. And you have so, to be very careful. It shouldn't spill over onto the, the bed of the... the you should the, also know the pupillary size before you... Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, I think it's a, it's a beautiful message which is uh, Somashila has uh, given because we have to be aware of this complication and probably prevent this complication and uh, probably how to uh, manage this. Namrata, I just quickly, we, 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 uh, since we're running short of time, suppose you're not done the procedure at that time, what you would have done later? So, so this patient. Would, would have would have uh, taken the patient later. Of course, she said, according to Somshila, the patient was overseas, so you couldn't wait. But I would have taken the patient after uh, after say three months for yeah. a procedure. How differently you would have done at that time? I would have. I'm sure there must be some problem. The patient has either moved the eye or yeah. uh, some problem is definitely there. So we would have just prevented that that it doesn't happen because if one eye has gone uneventfully. I see no reason why it didn't, you know, uh, go uneventfully here, except for the fact that probably the patient moved the eye. And a pupillary zone also has to be the size of the pupil is important before you decrease the optic zone to, you know, say that yes. you can still go ahead with it. I think that these are the kind of cases that we'll have in real life. Yeah. And whether it's at whatever stage it may be. So, so my typical tendency is that if I have a flap related complication, I don't proceed. Mm. If it's the first eye, I don't even touch the fellow eye. So come what may. But uh, so we are known as the senior surgeons now. Yeah. But, the, <laughs> but the younger generation, uh, and, also, and also because, you know, the, the fact remains that the patients are extremely demanding. So this plays on uh, the doctor's uh, mind as well when we are doing such cases. And, and you feel that most of the time the, 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 the results are extremely good. Like even in this case, I was... The reason I presented this case is because I think that if, if it had happened to me, I would have not proceeded with the surgery and I wouldn't have done the other eye either. But having gone ahead and done the case, I think it worked out very well. It just shows that the cornea is very forgiving or the, the, the conditions of the pupillary size, the optic zone, those things were actually fine. And, and that's how it worked out. So it was a very risk. It was a gamble, but it was a calculated gamble and it worked out in this particular case. You know, is it a good idea to ask the patient or you decide? Because when you so ask, the idea is to keep the patient informed, but depending on the psych, you know how psyched the patient already is and what is the patient's personality. So based on that, so the idea is to say that something, yeah, something is not right. It, I think it, honesty always works, but of course, there's no point in painting a dismal picture. But a little bit of honesty in terms of at least saying that this is a thing, and uh, you know, so that I think honesty always works in such situations. One, yeah. One. 
I just wanted to share a very quick point. Yes. What was shared was that there is some problem with the interface. I had a very unique problem where the PI, the interface which was there, got fogged up in a particular area. Mm -hmm. So either it could have been mucus or it could have been That's anything else. Was something so Kamal, was, Kamal was telling that only. Correct. Kamal said something was blocking yes. and I had yes. fogging of that. So something was definitely blocked that area. Yeah. No, but Himanshu and Kamal, the only thing that I am limited point that I am trying to make is uh, if there is something in the interface, there is a debris, there is mucus or even if what you are saying is that there could be fogging of the uh, or there is something the, that is stuck on onto the interface, you will see that the raster has not gone there. Absolutely. Yeah. You will Absolutely. see it. You can True. see it. I, yes. said, I said when I went back, I saw the files, it was there. On yeah. table, I noticed it. I noticed it on table. Yeah, so okay. then you are wiser whether to start lifting the flap at all or not. Okay. Because if you see a large enough area where you know that there is an uncut area, then you can do a trans PRK at the same sitting at that particular moment. Or if you want to postpone it, that's fine. But you can do a PRK at the same moment. Agreed. Absolutely. Without Absolutely. touching Agreed. the flap at all. Because you know something has gone wrong with the flap. Yes. Both situations, I was called in the theatre once it happened. Okay. Thanks, thanks, Maipal and all the panelists for the wonderful uh, thing and so much, Sheila, for the nice, beautiful video. I think it's a very, uh, I think it's an eye opener for all of us. Thank and we so go much. on to the next speaker since we are running short of time. Dr. Samresh Shivatsa, again a very, very young fellow and very uh, um, uh, dynamic uh, cataract and refractive surgery um, uh, refractive surgeon of Ragudi Pai Hospital, Jaipur, Ahmedabad. Uh, if if the, if the, if you ask. Uh, somebody question how many times uh, Samresh has won uh, the ASCRS and ASCRS awards and even the grand prize I think in the ASCRS it's probably the most number of times by any Indian because his videos are really out of the world and uh, everybody knows about it the quality of the videos and is very very innovative and, and uh, always comes up very new thoughts new inventions and so over to Samresh for this uh, for his video Samresh Thanks a lot, sir. I'm uh, and thanks for inviting me for this uh, webinar and thanks for calling me young. It's always very encouraging that way. <laughs> so I'm going to keep it very tight and very short. Uh, now with this, all this COVID, I'm only getting mature cataracts and posterior polar cataracts. And uh, so this is a case when you know sometimes you will be thrown these weird cases. And this is a patient, young female, who lands up with a unilateral posterior polar cataract. And when she comes to the clinic, she has the posterior capsule that is already ruptured. It's a pre-existing defect. It's rare, but I think everybody in the practices, all the senior doctors in the panel would have seen a few of these cases. This is just to show you, uh, this is the area of the open uh, posterior capsule. We decided to do a femto uh, in this, but that's not the point of the discussion today. Uh, we have a technique called uh, femto delineation for posterior polar cataracts. But in posterior polar cataracts, the idea is to build up the, avoid, avoid the uh, build up of hydraulic pressure inside the eye so as to avoid any posterior bulge of the posterior capsule and make it worse. My point for bringing about this case is to show you the optimal use of parameters. We are driving the car over here and you know the, the FECO machine is just for us. So it's very important to understand all the parameters well. Now this is a Centurion vision system which has uh, an active fluidix but to understand this is a very low IOP which means there's a very low bottle height of about a 30 or a 40. And I have very very low parameters running because I don't want to inflate deflate the globe too much to be able to so otherwise I'm going to rupture that small zipper that's open in the posterior capsule. Uh, the idea, like I said, I don't do any hydro maneuvers if I can avoid it with the femto. If at all, I'll do an inside-out delineation to just delineate the nucleus from the epinucleus area because you're really worried about getting the nucleus drop, not the epinucleus area. Uh, yeah, and once you remove the nucleus, I always do a viscoelastic exchange. So this is viscoat and exchange. Uh, remove your instruments only when you fill up your capsule, your compartment. So there's no anterior bulge. Again, I wanted to bring about the use of low parameters because you want control and absolute control at this point in time. So I'm using a very low IOP and I'm using a very controlled vacuum of about 150, 200 now slowly bumping it up because it's in a linear control and a 14 cc flow rate, which is a very, very low flow rate. Again, if you notice before I exchange my hands from left to right, I inject this coat to inflate the chamber again and remove uh, the remaining cortex on the other side. And this is the amount of control that a good fluidic system or even if not a good machine, but a good understanding of the machine fluidics brings about in your hands. And once you have done this, notice this is a small area of posterior capsule defect. And because you could salvage that area, because you could save that posterior capsule from enlarging the defect, you can now use those micro forceps that we've discussed so elegantly previously in many talks to convert that ragged posterior capsule or excess mar ragged posterior tear margin into a continuous curvilinear capsule or excess. We could do that in this case 
only because of experience we learn that if you go slow like when you're in a, you're driving fast there are chances you'll meet up with an accident but when you're driving slow slow you have immense control in your vehicle and you can actually target what you're hitting and so we were able to save the posterior capsule from enlarging and splitting like a zipper and once we did that we were able to convert that ragged edge into a continuous curvy linear posterior capsular axis and it's you know it's 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 no brainer to understand that a round margin is a much stronger margin because we knew we were able to deliver this uh, or obviously because there can be vitreous uh, it's a good idea to stain with triamcin alone my choice of uh, vitrectomy is generally a pass than a vitrectomy but i'm just going with the limbal vitrectomy here because in certain situations with the limbal vitrectomy and uh, bevel turned upside down you can get enough clearing in that area and because i knew more likely that with my technique of low parameters i will be able to commit to a patient with a high astigmatism and this is a patient where you know anybody i was scared for the uh, umpteen number of times i've been scared to commit to advanced technology iols but with advancement of technology more importantly with understanding and clear understanding of fluidics uh, you can now commit these patients to advanced technology iols a toric a high toric a t7 in this case and notice how elegantly the lens is sitting well centered continuous uh, all around surrounded by a good capsular excess margin which could be a manual capsular excess although it's a femto here and that really doesn't make a difference if you're a good surgeon and this is how the patient looks two weeks post operatively so things could have gone south in this surgery but we were able to control it and my one case one pearl is you please use your fluidics right especially for the junior surgeons you don't want machine parameters you want to listen to the machine and you want to listen to your surgeons on how to optimize your machinery to your optimum performance thank you what a wonderful video samresh and what a lovely take home message and uh, suppose you have a patient with a mature cataract and you do not know what exactly is happening yes sir in patient post the polar cataract how do you know pre operatively this patient was you were able, able to see the break pre operatively yes sir. so i mean i generally sir for me the other eye is a big take away yeah. uh, so people look out to the other eye either a badly done surgery or a sulcus lens if they been operated elsewhere because generally when that's when they turn up to me or uh, maybe uh, you know a, a posterior polar cataract which is quite evidently visible in a mature cataract for me the oct does not penetrate down to the posterior capsule level so we tend to use a ubm uh, for all our mature cataracts to look for posterior capsule integrity and a b scan also sometimes gives a giveaway of a fish tail sometimes so i trying to do and see at every angle possible uh, by whatever mechanisms you have i am i understand that it's you know some people some people will have a b scan and some people may not have an access to a ubm but if it's a mature cataract i anticipate a defect and i move accordingly and prove myself wrong otherwise absolutely i think uh, the important message what samresh told i want all the uh, panelists as well as the other people to uh, this thing is uh, look at the other eye if you have a mature cataract look at the other eye if you have a lens in the sulcus or an ac iol or an iris claw lens or some vitreous disturbance probably is a posterior polar cataract you have to be careful in doing the hydro dissection in this case and ubm is one way i, mean, I do in all these cases whether it's a pre existing or a, a or a confirmed posterior polar cataract i do only femto nowadays i want to take over the um, um, questions to the panel now mypal i know question. you have a lot of experience you got a beautiful paper also published in the AC, uh, jcrs now recently mypal is there so can i have one question for dr samresh yeah uh, uh, dr samresh it was a wonderful surgery but even after your posterior capsular excess why did you have to go ahead and do an vitrectomy when your intact hyoid phase was yeah, so that's a great question nishan the vitreous phase was an intact so when i stained it with trans zone i could see vitreous trans and that's why i went ahead and cleared up that zone also right. if you go posterior capsular excess and you if you if you there's any disturbance it's best to go under the capsular excess margin 360 degrees and clear it so you have a stable scaffold and your eye will won't tilt with incomplete vitrectomy like this so it's a good idea beautiful message i think because please don't underestimate the vitreous and uh, what i'm trying to say is if you do a posterior capsular you always check with the triamcin estate diluted triamcin estate and check whether the vitreous is there sometimes the vitreous can be coming and post operatively it'll come and start peaking the pupil as well mypal quickly so mohan uh, what you said uh, the case that you presented or you said uh, if you have a mature cataract i did have it once and uh, the patient uh, unfortunately i didn't uh, look at the other eye that well Yeah, and I did a capsular excess. Did a did a uh, reasonably uh, good hydro dissection, and uh, that was the fastest cataract extraction that I had. <laughs> so, uh, 
the problem is that the patients don't tell you uh, that they had a problem in the other eye and then after that they would uh, tell me that this was uh, uh, earlier in my practice before Dr. Uh, Dinesh Talwar and Lalit Verma had joined so I had to send the patient to Cyrus Shroff. Mm. So this was way back in uh, I would say 98 or something like that. At that particular time we didn't know too much about polar cataract but then the patient never tells you that they have had a problem in the other eye. So that is something very, very eye, uh, very, very important that you have to look at the other eye. Yeah. Uh, fortunately, whatever we have also described is uh, on the femto, on the OCT. But if you have a mature cataract, as you were saying, the OCT will not be able to pick it up. Give you the posterior uh, uh, aspect of the lens. So that is a big, big problem. Ultrasound may or may not be able to pick up. I think it's not as reliable at all to be even a UBM to pick up uh, pre-existing defects to that extent. So that is a absolute uh, case where uh, you really can't do anything and most probably you will not be treating it as a polar cataract until of course mm -hmm. the patient is giving you a, 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 a reasonable history. But pre-operative evaluation as uh, Samresh said, even on the slit lamp, if it is not a mature cataract, you can see it. You can do a pre-operative OCT, even the IOL Master 700 at times you can do. And uh, all these methodologies can be used pre-operatively. And the Femto gives you a fantastic thing where you can have a cushion right till the end. Uh, you have pre-sectioned it, you have a good capsular excess and uh, you can get away with... Uh, I have not touch wood have a nucleus drop ever since I have uh, been uh, uh, switching over to a femto in a posterior polar cataract and that is a treatment of choice for me. Uh, if a patient is having a posterior polar cataract, I am suspecting a pre-existing, I will force the patient to go in for a, a femto. I have even done it free of cost for uh, two of my patients who could not afford a femto, but I think that is a treatment of choice. Uh, I think uh, RP Center is also published and uh, you can... Visualization gives you a great, great insight. The OCT visualization gives you a great, great insight into what is likely to happen in this particular case. Absolutely. I think Maipal, you hit the nail on the head because Femto makes it much easier. You have better control of the situation and the nucleus is already pre-cut. Everything is done. You need to just go in and do, uh, the, the, remove the, uh, the nucleus. And um, uh, Namrata, quickly. One or two words. Yeah, I would just one, like or two. Two. Yeah, one or two things. One is if you do a swept source OCT and we have a KCR2 with us, then it just it, it picks up better than normal uh, high definition OCT because of the resolution which is better. UBM can pick up some of the times like Samrej said. And uh, we do intra-op OCT with the, with the advantage with the intra-op OCT is that as you do debulking of the, of the nucleus and as you do debulking of the cataract, your, your bulk which is left becomes lesser and lesser. The plate becomes thinner and thinner. And then the visualization on the intraopposity becomes better because now you have, you know, less amount of tissue which is at the, at the PC. And uh, our paper which is on the various OCT aspects, uh, we've described two signs which are very important. One is the conical sign and other is the moth heaton appearance. So that will be published in next month's uh, JCRS uh, on the KCR2. And then we've Correlated KCR2 pre op ASOCT with the intra op OCT. So that kind of really helps if you, you, you can actually correlate the two much better. And what we do now is, of course, uh, the most expensive thing, and that is we do femto, then get the patient to an intra op OCT microscope and then do a IOCT guided uh, posterior polar cataract. So it is combining uh, all the technologies together. Yeah, I've seen those videos, uh, Manamrata, it is very impressive. And um, uh, Gaurav? Yes, sir. What yeah, I think all great points. Just two things to add. Mm -hmm. One is that assume that all mature cataracts are posterior polars unless proven otherwise. So mm -hmm. that way, you know, you can uh, avoid hydrodissection because mature cataracts as it is, you don't need to hydrodissect. They will rotate anyway. Second thing, if a patient has a history of a previous vitrectomy or injections, be very, very careful because you may have PC defects there. And again, those these are the two. Otherwise, Samresh, you know, spoke so well on low infusion and uh, control of parameters mm -hmm. and Dr. Maipal on Femto. Yes. Both yeah. my favorite things, yes. Yeah. Kamal? Mm. Uh, I think Samresh, a phenomenal video. Very lucid uh, explanation. I agree with uh, Gaurav and Dr. Maipal. Uh, last webinar, Dr. Mohan was with me. I showed a similar case, mature cataract with polar. You remember? Yes. And absolutely. there also the patient history gave me away. Uh, 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 Dr. Maipal, the patient said that Purana operation had a little problem. Tha, so we dilated and saw that the IL was in the sulcus and there was a PC red. And this head patient had come with a polar cataract. So last webinar, I showed that video. 
So I operated a mature cataract with a pre-existing opening, knowing that yet there is something wrong because the other eye, a summation of beautiful point that the other eye was examined carefully. One good point is ask the patient uh, how much time it took for the other eye. Yeah. Okay, they normally come out with this thing. It will take one hour, two hours, mm -hmm. something like that. That will give an indication that some problem has occurred during the surgery. So, the, uh, uh, since we don't have uh, any other questions from the on the on the from the audience link, no boss. There's so something wrong with the link. I just Dennis, want to Dennis, say one thing. When is dinner time? Yeah, Kumar. Quickly. Yes, excellent talk. I just want to say that wherever we've noticed pre-existing rent in the PC, it's quite a strong hold on to that area. So it's not a weak point. It's a strong point. So all the precautions that he's taken are brilliant. We have to follow them. It's not that. But I've seen that the pre-existing rents which are there in the PC are not those thin, fragile PCs. In these cases, we find them to be quite strong and they hold on quite well, is what I have noticed. And the vitreous by... phase is most no. often intact. No, what I'm surprised, Samresh, is that the only thing I would uh, think in a, in a typical pre-existing posterior polar cataract, it is not like the defect what you showed. It is like two pillars there Yeah. on the posterior yeah. capsule. Like the video I showed. Yes, similar to what uh, Kamal showed in the last webinar. So, it's very difficult to do a posterior capsular excess. What I do is normally put a multi-piece lens in the sulcus and capture the, um, yes. the, they do the optic capture. So, this doesn't look like, it looked like a, for, for me, it looked like a avastin, intravitreal avastin injection, which has been uh -huh. given that can touch the posterior capsule or during vitrectomy, we have lens touch. You can have a PC yes. there like that. That could very well be the case because this was only one eye uh, cataract. The other was absolutely clear. That is why, why I was thinking whether it could be a posterior polar or something else. I think it's a very clever observation, Dr. Uh, Mohan. Whenever you have a pre-existing opening, it's a two straight pillars running from one equator to another. Absolutely. Absolutely. Very. And uh, George, you haven't stayed in the center. Add? George? George Baker. I have nothing to add. The comments have been really good. Fantastic. So we'll go on to the next uh, presenter. And uh, again, another guy who doesn't require any introduction at all. And uh, he is a new sensation, I would say, just like the, the corona. The corona is a bad <laughs> corona, but this, this guy is a good corona. <laughs> this guy is a good corona for all of us. And you know, Ashwin Agarwal is, uh, see, the, the next two speakers you know anything can go wrong in your life. Your profession can go wrong, your, um, your spouse can go wrong. And your life, uh, business can go wrong, but genes cannot go wrong. And Ashwin Agarwal and Nishant have proved that very well. And Ashwin Agarwal, as you know, is a very, very good surgeon, excellent speaker, cataract, cornea, refractive, anterior segment, reconstruction. He does everything. Chairman of the clinical board and his uh, grand rounds of the Agarwal Hospital is uh, something which is uh, very, very popular. And Dr. Agarwal's group of eye hospital is, a, is also the executive medical director. And over to Dr. Ashwin. Ashwin? Yes, sir. Thank you uh, so much for the kind words, uh, Mohan. And I think this whole webinar has been absolutely just stunning. I mean, uh, in its own way, in terms of what it's bringing to the audience. Uh, what I'm going to talk about today is a little different from what uh, I think we've, we've all seen the preclude. Actually, a lot of people spoke about it in terms of progressive conditions and having the bag IOL complex, maybe with, a, with or without a CTR on the retina and so many problems that do come up with it. But at the same time, I think we also speaking to anterior segment surgeons and anterior segment surgeons having this issue of having infusion, vitrectomy, whether to do what to do in these scenarios, especially if it's a milder case. And in these progressive conditions, milder case, what should I do? How do I precaution myself in terms of moving forward? So I'm just going to show a, a very simple case, but I think it's interesting. Let's let's watch. It's uh, so how many times we all get this a lot of times uh, in our cases? Can you see the video? Where well, yeah. I'm shaking the lens, but nothing is uh, happening on that front, and in fact, it was not moving. The the subluxation was not shown. But as and when we go into the case, and we'll uh, see this as we move. The bag is slightly moving now. If you see here, the bag is slightly moving, but that's probably not enough right now to go ahead and do anything. I know I can probably survive with the current zonules there are. And the position that we really want to hold over here is that caution, but move slowly and cautiously. Uh, one thing that you, sh what I like to do in these cases is wherever I see that maximum amount of subluxation, I always put a capsular hook 
uh, I try not to use the iris hooks, but if in case it, that's the only thing I have in certain uh, centers, then that's the only thing I have. But uh, capsular hook works really well. It goes up all the way up onto the equator. Uh, and then continue my case as a normal phaco emulsification, nothing different as such. Uh, once you've pretty much removed, I try not to do this in the bag because any kind of zonular stress, I try to reduce that, especially in softer cataracts. Uh, and this trick, maybe I would say avoid it. You can always do an irrigation aspiration, which is what I kind of switched over to. Uh, and once you're done with the irrigation aspiration, reassess and then continue this step of final cortical uh, removal. Uh, and what, why I'm saying that is you might really want to reassess the amount of subluxation. Sometimes what happens is suddenly the subluxation starts to look a lot more and you'll start seeing that this whole bag is come. Uh, there you go. That compression from the equator side. But I left this intro, that capsular hook in place. I didn't actually remove it. What I tried to do different here was no vitrectomy, no infusion. Keep the, the vitreous is not disturbed yet. So I really don't have any reason to go and disturb the vitreous. So what I'm trying to do here is glued, but not really glued. So I'm making my flaps in place. And next step is probably the most tricky one over here, where I have to make this uh, into the sulcus space. I really can't go directly deep down. I have to make this uh, sclerotomies directed first vertically down and then into this uh, sulcus space is what I'm trying to get into. Now, I don't remove my second uh, needle. I actually use that use like a Yamane technique, but just injecting that haptic into the, railroading that haptic into this uh, uh, needle. And once this is pretty much all the way in, I just remove it. And uh, now, once I have that, I don't use any assistant in usually in all my glutes. Uh, what I try to do is place it inside because you really have to go into the sulcus of the second side as well, the trailing haptic side. Now, once you're done with that, you can handshake that out, uh, out of its, uh, in its way. And now you have a IOL in the sulcus space. You can use, uh, now once you remove this capsular hook, you'll see the amount of subluxation from that bag. But what I'm trying to get to is over here, if you can use, always try to use that anterior capsular rim. Uh, in this case, I was not able to do it, but in the other cases that I have, I, uh, I was able to show that. I don't have a video of that, but if you can use that anterior capsular rim to come above that uh, IOL, uh, that really helps avoid any optic capture that you might have. So basically, I've not done any anterior vitrectomy or any of that. Let me tell you some advantages to this, but after this gluing. Now, I've just glued that and left it in place. Uh, let's see, this is the three-week post-op of the same patient. Uh, so pre and post, we definitely see a difference between the two. Some of the advantages that I wanted to say, you don't use infusion. I have not done a vitrectomy, so undisturbed the vitreous body is. Intact compartmentalization. The lens is in the posterior, that is IOL, is in the posterior chamber. There's no risk of IOL drop or tilt post-operatively. Uh, any reduce, reduces any post-operative inflammation and it's a very quick recovery to normalcy. These are some of the advantages that I have seen in this uh, in these cases. These are my that's my pearl, one case, one pearl that I wanted to share with you guys. Phenomenal stuff, Ashwin. I think uh, the supra uh, capsular glued eye oil is a technique I think you have uh, published as well. And um, this is a, I was wondering why because the subluxation was only. If, uh, who are three Krakahars? Yeah. Them, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's a very good point. So, yeah. Why I, you wouldn't use a CTR and put a lens in this uh, in the bag? Correct. I could have done that. And the patient was a young patient, number one, uh, has at least 50 years more to go. And uh, what, I've, what I've kind of seen is in, in 10 years' time, if it's a progressive condition, had some amount of uh, uh, this thing. Uh, so, whenever it's a progressive condition, I always try to. Uh, avoid doing a CTR unless it that's the only thing that I can do. But in, and, and in this case, it was more of an innovative technique to kind of stabilize the IOL while having the bag, not disturbing the vitreous and able to uh, successfully do it. If you have a larger, if let's say you have a larger uh, uh, subluxation, it actually, the vitreous kind of gets disturbed. Uh, these are the only cases where you can actually go through with it without disturbing the vitreous. That's what I have seen. Maybe microspirophagia. These are some of the cases where you can go to get through uh, without actually disturbing vitreous and placing an intraocular lens inside. 
No, uh, the reason why I asked that question was because when we started the glue dye wheels about 10 or 12 years back in 2007 or 8, Amar always used to tell, okay, and even now we are practicing the same thing, that you should remove all the capsular and cortical remnants in the pupillary area so that, and also the vitreous there, so that the vitreous doesn't come and get Correct. Uh, 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 this thing into the, uh, into the crude aisle portion, in the, into the sclerostomy site there. Nice. So, to prevent post-operative detachment or retinal breaks or something like that. So, I was wondering whether uh, to, it's a good idea to leave the capsule because you do not know what's happening, whether the vitreous phase disturbed are there. Inferiorly, I could see some vitreous coming in that uh, zonular area. I was uh, wondering whether it's, uh, you check whether vitreous was there or not. At, uh, what was yeah. coming was the bag. And uh, so that was, I was very clear on watching what that was. That was the yes. bag trying to crumple. Uh, you know, usually when you lose the nucleus, the bag usually crumples on itself. And that's something that happens on the zonular weakness side. Uh, the vitreous in that, in this case was not coming. In the other, another case was there, where you have a larger subluxation. In those cases, the vitreous does tend to come forward. And you have to actually move over to a proper glue dial in that case. Absolutely. And um, uh, let, before I go into the pattern, I think you, you showed one very important thing that to hold the capsular, um, the, uh, the capsular excess margin with the capsular hook rather than yeah. an iris hook because the iris hook can tear the capsular excess margin. And you did that very well. And that's a very good take home point. I want everybody to have a capsular hook in, the, in their armamentarium uh, before they start doing all these complicated surgeries. Before we uh, go on to the panelists, Maipal. No, he's he's gone, I think. Okay, he's Namrata, gone. you tell me what... Uh, I think what? it was a very nice technique, uh, another modification of doing, another way of doing a, you know, glued and not so glued IOL. And then I think you've also described in Miguel O'Connor's how you can take out the lens through the iris and described here now that, you know, you can take it out through the sulcus. The, the haptic of the three-piece lens can also be taken out through the sulcus. Uh, but yes, uh, I might, I mean, if I had been there and not thought about glue dial, I would have done what Mohan is saying and that is I would have put a mm -hmm. CTR and then put That was my first thought. Yeah. I completely, that was my yeah. first thought. Definitely. If it's a, a non-progressive kind of a dialysis. Yeah. Uh, Gaurav? Yeah, I think uh, <clears throat> Ashwin showed an amazing new technique yet again. Uh, and he did it so well because, you know, it's not so easy to get, uh, you know, in a bag which is not totally subluxated or dislocated. You know, getting into the sulcus uh, with a needle without puncturing the bag is not going to be easy. You need to really distend the bag with viscoelastic. Otherwise, there's a chance that, you know, it'll just shallow and you might, the needle might just catch the bag and you might get a, you know, uncontrolled PC break. Yet, I think, uh, you know, this technique may hold a lot of promise uh, in the future. It has, uh, you know, he, he showed it very elegantly. Yet again, you know, again, uh, you know, in lesser hands, I think we would just put the CTR and put the IOL in the bag. Come on. Thanks, Gaurav. Yeah, I, I agree with Gaurav 100%. I think in, in, in Ashwin's hand, it works great. For a beginner surgeon, especially in a partial subluxation, it's not an easy task to get the needle in through and without puncturing the capsule. So he got away with it. Uh, CTR recommended for a smaller subluxation for most of the people. Yes, but again, it's an amazing technique. Yeah. So I completely agree with the whole panel and everybody here that, you know, if you're not experienced at glue dial, you must not try this. When first get the basics of glue dial right. Get the infusion right. Get the flaps right. Get the sclerotomies right. Get to do an anterior vitrectomy right. And then if you are evolved to move to this uh, probable segment, then you should probably try. This is probably a little more challenging than normal in terms of, uh, I completely agree, especially the one, <clears throat> the two steps. The first step is the sulcus sclerotomy. That is the first tricky step. And the second step is to actually externalize the haptics through that sulcus sclerotomy. Yeah. Everything True. else is pretty much the same. There's nothing that changes. These two steps, if we get right in this, you, you've, you've nailed it. Okay. Well, well, I want to say one point. Yeah, yeah, Kumar. Well, Samresh has done some research on this because you're saying that you're putting a three-piece in the sulcus. So pigment dispersion, uh, running of, uh, you know, the back surface of the iris against the three-piece IOL is going to be much higher in such cases than you would do uh, putting a blue dial a little posteriorly. So I, I don't know if Samresh is still around because they have done a retrospective study on where exactly to put the pot and exactly where the irritation of the haptic to the back surface of the iris uh, would be quite high in such cases. So I'm just wondering whether 
no, somebody, right yeah, somebody's video is with the Miyake views and all that. Yes. Good. Yeah, we've seen that video. Uh, I, I, that is exactly the question I wanted to ask Ashwin as well because we, we definitely have... because it's rubbing on the back of the iris and these are all square edge lenses. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, no, uh, mm -hmm. rub on the back of the iris because it's so anterior. No, it's close to the surface of the back surface of the iris. I'm wondering whether a UGH syndrome and all these problems can occur. Uh, so what I would say is we've got about ten or ten plus cases of these right now. Uh, maybe a little bit more, but I think we are still on follow up mode. It's only been a year that we have got our longest follow up on this. I think we'll wait for some more time before I uh, can disclose whatever uh, the result is of that. Ashwin, I just have one final question to ask. Sure. Do you feel there is some benefit in retaining the capsule? Is yes. there any benefit? Because anyway, you've done a glued eye veil. So yeah. what is the benefit of retaining the capsule? Uh, I, as I told you, if you're an anterior segment surgeon and you're not comfortable doing infusion, not comfortable doing anterior vitrectomy, then there is uh, uh, some help in doing such a procedure, number one. The and the anterior rim of the anterior capsule that has vital importance even in a normal glue diet. So I would not actually recommend you anybody to remove the whole capsular bag. You remove the posterior capsule absolutely fine. As much as possible, I try to always retain that anterior capsular rim. That anterior capsular rim avoids me from doing any single pass fourth row so that my optic capture does not happen. That the optic capture is not, it will not happen if I have an anterior capsular rim. That IOL optic will not be able to go above the anterior, anterior rim of the capsular axis. That is a big advantage of actually holding on as much as possible. Take off the cortex, take off the bag from the posterior capsule, take off everything else, anterior zonules and anterior capsule. Leave it as much as you can. These George wants to add something. Cool. Yeah, you mean to say you, uh, you want to uh, retain, uh, leave that uh, anterior capsular uh, margin on the surface yes. of the eye Yes, yes. Because that then, the reason I'm doing seeing pupiloplasty is so that my optic edge does not go above the iris. But and the that he makes a lot of sense what he's saying. He's absolutely right because that anterior capsular rim and the aisle behind the anterior capsular rim protects Retains that aisle from coming up or, you know, kind of catching the pupil. I think he's what he's saying is so so right. Yes, beautiful, very nice. I think it's very innovative and. Uh, but there is a there is a, a problem, Ashwin, because there can be some amount of capsular contracture which can happen, and then that can pull the lens uh, this way or that way. So it's uh, actually I wouldn't really uh, recommend that from my point of view. The other thing is. When you're trying that to, is not there. How can that is not there. Is not there. Not there. Back, but still, there is some. It's going to be it's, if it's going to be close to the capsule. The other thing is, you know, when when you're trying to uh, uh, exteriorize the haptic, if there is a um, capsule that can actually make it more difficult. So uh, that is one point I, I have against leaving behind a capsule. Leaving behind the posterior capsule or the anterior, ma'am? You left behind the whole bag, isn't it? In this, no, case, this case, case, okay. In this case, I agree with you that uh, leaving behind the bag. But as I said, I think the bag of contracture will happen only if there's something inside the bag. One second is what is happening in this case particularly is I had a clean bag. I had a uh, I had a very small amount of subluxation, and the most important over here was I did not want to disturb the vitreous, which was not disturbed. So keeping these things in mind, uh, and it gives another armamentarium to some direction where you can actually uh, do a glute where you have stable IOL while not disturbing the whole vitreous or posterior segment. The technique was excellent. That I must say. It's very good a technique. George, you would like to comment on that? I would try this. It, it, you know, I, I, <clears throat> I kind of uh, agree with Sujatha. I'm not sure what the benefit is of saving the bag. Um, and in this case, in this particular case, with only a few clock hours of loss, I'd be tempted to put a multi-piece IOL, put the haptics in the direction of the loss of the zonules, and put in a CTR. If yeah. I had more loss and I had a preserved anterior capsule with a capsule rexus, um, I would put my haptics into the sulcus and just optic capture post with the capsular rexus, the optic. Um, 
I mean, David Chang's been doing that for over 10 years and shown yeah, that yeah. that works quite well. So I have to, and again, Ashwin, you did a fantastic job, but I have to wonder why we need to glue that IOL because um, we haven't seen that those will dislocate, especially with the amount of, of loss that you have there. Sure, I, I agree with uh, all your comments, uh, George. I yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a beautiful, it's a, I think but, it's a But I think, you know, your comments about being careful about how you orient the, the needle are, are very important. I mean, if you saw my first case where I put the um, piggyback into the sulcus and had to glue it, I came almost at, um, you know, parallel to the iris in the way that I penetrated the um, the right uh, the eye and then you have to be very careful about what what you're Absolutely. doing so i think not orienting towards the center of the globe it's actually doing at a different plane and so i think that's the important part from the, your video showing how to orient that needle i think one is the two important things are there one is the distance from the limbus and the direction of the needle am i right ashwin yeah. yes sir absolutely yeah, absolutely so we go on to the final presentation always we keep the Best for the last, and uh, uh, Mahendra Singh Dhoni is always a finisher, and uh, uh, Nishant is, uh, is the finisher for us. And uh, Nishant and uh, Nivian have taken MNI Hospital to totally different level altogether. They are also a postgraduate institute. Nishant is a very young guy, and is a good uh, cataract and cornea and refractive surgeon, and from Chennai. Over to Dr. Nishant, and it's uh, always a pleasure to. Uh, I have Nishant here with us and uh, Thank you. To, yeah, Nishant, all yours. Yes, sir. Thank you, IRSI, Amar sir, Mohan Rajan sir and the whole panelists. I'm just sharing my screen. Is it visible, sir? Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, so uh, a very good evening to esteemed ostomologists or uh, rather I would say a very late evening to everyone over here. So, I'm sure that uh, all of us must have seen this movie, Armageddon, where the amount of stress and the skill they take to implant the bomb in the center so that the nucleus breaks completely into two halves is what I'm going to talk about. So, I'm going to give pearls on how do we crack a hard mature cataract. Dr. Samresh has told about the PPC and I'll talk about the hard mature cataract. I have no financial or political interest. I'll say in the end why I said this actually. So we all come across cataracts like this, which are actually very hard and we start trenching for a long time. We do a lot of trench. It does not trench too much. Even if we use high phaco energy, there might be an endothelial loss or wound burn. And even if we try to crack this nucleus, I mean, there are two fast phaco surgeons in Tamil Nadu. One is Nishant and one is Dr. Mohan Rajan. Mohan Rajan the uh, nucleus anteriorly, but uh, I think you all see how Nishant removes this nucleus in a fraction of a second. But the only thing is it goes posteriorly. <laughs> so how to avoid these kinds of situations are the tips which I'm going to give. To start basic, I would say about the side port. If you can see the side port which I make on the right side will always be the full thickness. And the one which I make on the left side for only the dialer or the chopper, you can see that I go only half the distance so you don't have wound leak. And I don't use an air bubble through the right side because you can see that the air bubble keeps coming out. So what I usually do is go through this side, form the air bubble so that while staining, the corneal endothelium does not get stained. And while washing it, do not use the left side, use the right side because you want the saline to come out. So these are few tips which I would say for staining the nucleus. And then for making the clear corneal entry, I always make a small first incision groove. The second I do a small tunnel with my keratome. Mm -hmm. so uh, so this mute? Yeah. that the second plane is uh, absolutely stable and then it's almost like a triplanar incision which you are doing for even a clear corneal FAFCO. So the wound integrity is going to be amazing and the chances of wound burn are going to be less. So this is one of the techniques which I'm going to show for the mature cataracts for beginners to convert because they are the ones who are always afraid about the hard mature cataracts. So I make a groove. But the only thing is I don't make a full groove, but I go to the end of the groove and bury my phaco probe. So you can see that the cracking is done very easily and it does not need too much of phaco energy where you have to do something like a four quadrant. And you need not be worried about a direct chop which you have to bury too much into the nucleus. You can see that once you get it into two halves, I'm definitely sure that it's going to be like any other phaco surgery. 
So this is what I am going to talk about. So I got this technique called the V chop. So you should see that I'm making a small V from the entry on both sides. So this requires very less FECO energy. And exactly at the apex of the V, I start burying my FECO probe. The only way to know that the FECO probe is deep enough is your FECO probe should not be seen from anterior. As you can see, it has disappeared. Then I go from horizontal and split it vertical. And you can see how neatly it is chopped. So this need not have too much of pressure. And for surgeons who are just converting from a stop and chop to a direct chop, you need not fear that whether you are buried enough into the nucleus. Because the only thing about a chop is make sure that your phaco probe is buried always into the nucleus. If it is too anterior, you will have a slip of the phaco probe. And once you get all the cataracts, which is made into small pieces, emulsification is going to be very easy even for a mature cataract. And one more small thing is keep the phaco probe always in the center at the level of iris plane, not too close to the cornea to make sure that the endothelial loss will be there and not to down to the posterior capsule because the chances of the posterior capsule rupture will also be there. You can even try to make use of the burst mode. Make sure that you know your parameters for your burst mode and make sure that the anterior chamber is always perfectly formed in these cases. You can see that even after a hard mature cataract, this kind of co clear cornea is and without any wound burn is all what we expect out of mature cataracts. So this is the technique which I told you to start with. If you're finding difficult to do the V, you can actually do it one side like a small groove near the uh, capsule margin, rotate the nucleus, and then you do the other V there if you're not able to get the V from the uh, tip. So then you can see that I've buried and then the chop starts. Like uh, Dr. Gaurav sir said that uh, the chop depends upon what you are comfortable is. Dr. Nivian, my brother, he always said that uh, it's neither the direct chop, nor the vertical chop, nor the horizontal chop. It is your chop, which is the best kind of a chop. So you should know which chop to use for what nucleus. These are leathery cataracts, and even for these, it will be the best. And we all know the, uh, the magic wand of Harry Potter who says the expectro petronum for uh, defeating all the devils. So the same way the phaco probe is in your hand to make sure that all these kinds of cataracts get these kinds of amazing results with the V-chop. As I told you in the beginning, there are no political interests. So what I meant V was for victory. Keep that in mind. And I thank uh, Mohan Rajan sir and all the speakers and the panelists. Thank you. Beautiful. What a lovely presentation, uh, Nishant. I think at the end of the day, you, you, I think you've got some very nice messages. Only thing is, in the mature cataract, when you want to do the V, because you are in the periphery, not in the center, when you're making the groove, what will be the size of your rexis there? For mature cataracts, I make it around 5.5 to 6 millimeters. 5.5 to 6 millimeters. Yes. Because sir. if you're going to be a little long, uh, larger rexis, it's going to go to the periphery in mature cataract. More chances are going to the periphery. Uh, I want yeah. to take the opinion of... Uh, uh, Dr. Namrata, Gaurav and Kamal quickly on this. Namrata, what exactly is your take on this uh, beautiful I think, uh, I think it was a beautiful video, uh, Nishant. And so many things you take for granted, but those things you spelled out in your video. And that was the best part. I mean, you just think you would do it like that. But you made, it's a great teaching video for the fellows and your V technique is also very impressive. In hard cataracts, whenever you try to put the phaco probe, that tongue thing, you know, the tongue sort of a protrusion always comes out and then that tells you that it is going to be hard. So you've taken advantage of that very fact and you have extrapolated it into, you know. So I think it was a great demonstration and uh, Dr. Mohan Rajan pointed out very rightly that you should not be taking it to the periphery, it should remain in the center and should not be making a very large rexes also. So I think he covered yeah. almost... Uh, Beautiful. I think beautiful. Nice. Yeah. Very nice message. Uh, some people do the horizontal uh, trench instead of the vertical. In hard cataracts, they make the horizontal trench and then go bury the into the uh, this thing. Yes, I find yeah. Nishant before we go on to the Gaurav and thing. I find your your tip is not sufficiently exposed. Uh, when you have hard cataracts, I always make sure that your tip is Absolutely. very well exposed. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Kamal and Gaurav? Yeah. I think a, a wonderful video, as usual, Nishant. You know, very crisp understanding of the dynamics and the FACO and the settings of the machine. 
I find your, your, your explanations are very, very lucid and very in-depth. Few things, as I, Dr. Mohan said, whenever I'm doing a hard cataract, I do a few things. I, uh, people may frown at that. I make a slightly leaky wound. For the reason, it will not, I will not land up with a burn. So just before I'm about to come out with my keratome, I just move my keratome slightly one way. And probably from a two, if I'm going a 2.2, I may be made making a 2.3 or 2.4. So I never get a wound burn if I can use a lot of phaco energy and still get away with it because my sides of the wound are pouring out water, number one. Number two, I expose the phaco tip higher than normal, as Dr. Mohan Rajan said. Number three, I do not, in these cases, the zonules are a bit goner. They're, they're a little weak. Anterior zonules are weak, especially in the advanced cataracts. And you will need a lot of chopping energy, you know, give a vertical pressure downwards. So what I do is, if I'm not able to make a deep trench, I do not go for it. If it's a cataract, it's very hard. I'm not able to go deeper. Then I go to create a burrow. So what I do is I embed my phaco tip into a burrow and I lift the whole nucleus up while my chopper is going down. So the forces on the bag are distributed. And then as I'm approaching my phaco tip, I separate. So this is the second thing I do. The th fourth thing I do is I aim for a larger rexis. A 5.5 would be a normal size rexis for me. But in case I'm going in for a harder cataract, a crisp brown or a beetle nut cataract, I would aim for a larger rexis because, you know, that will give me a lot of freedom to move around into the back, move with my chopper, do a side chop, vertical chop, peripheral chop, flip chop. So going in for a larger capsule rexis makes a lot of sense. So these four little points, I would be handling slightly differently. Also, Lovely. Lovely. When you have a larger rexis, the chances of... Uh, you know, uh, uh, damage to the bag becomes much less. So the uh, chance of zonular dialysis is much less. So you have... That's what I said. In, 5 in, 5 a, is in a brown not, cataract, I, about 5.5, I make Bigger it. than 5.5, sir. In a mature cataract, it's not... I would say not, 6 millimeter is a good size. No, yeah. no. In a, in a mature cataract, it's not a good idea to go larger because you can lose... But I think, I think we have to differentiate between an intumescent and a hard cataract, you know? Like if it's an intumescent cataract... When we say a mature cataract, it different. necessarily may not be an intumescent hard, cataract. Hard cataracts. Right. No, no. If you have a hard brown cataract with almost negligible cortex and you know no internal integral pressure is not high, I would definitely aim for a, a bigger rexus like the 5.56 as uh, Kamal said because yeah. that gives you ample room because when you're doing lateral separation and you're chopping these nuclei, you know, you tend to break the rexus sometimes. So having a bigger rexus is always going to be good. Second thing, I think everybody's given all the points. I'll just add one or two, which I think yes. you know might add on to this. When you're doing lateral separation, as you have to do in hard cataracts and they are leathery, you know, you have to go to the posterior extent and do the lateral separation. If you try to do it anterior, you'll have to stretch the rexus much more. So I think that's one uh, additional point that, you know, be very careful about the lateral separation. Go down deep into the trench and then separate from the posterior plate rather than, you know, trying to separate the anterior plate and expect, expecting it to extend to the posterior plate. That's one thing. Second thing, uh, I feel that the woodpecker technique works really well in my hands for these super hard cataracts. And uh, you can, uh, you know, embed and then put in your chopper, try to, yeah. uh, you know, bring it closer and then give a burst of phaco, you know, that that immediately translates into a chop. And I think uh, it's worth trying. It, I have used it all these years. And the third thing that I might want to add here is that uh, for the supra hard cataracts, if it's like a black uh, cataractor nigra, I will not hesitate to shift from a direct chop to a stop and chop at any time. I think for all people who, uh, you know, are not the best, like who don't have the Mohan Rajan chopper with them, for them, uh, we have to, you know, think about doing a stop and chop. It always helps. But you don't have to have a very large trench if it's just one to one and a half times the width of the, uh, you know, this thing. And then only the central part is where you really need the trench to go deep. You know, in the periphery, you don't need to go very deep. So these few tips, in addition to what everybody has already added, I think the talk was excellent. Uh, beautiful. Nishant. I think it's a beautiful talk. And uh, you, 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 given all the messages, Gaurav, Kamal and uh, Namrata, all the panelists and uh, it's beautiful. George time. wants to add something, Mohan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's shaking his hand, yes. Who's that? George. George. George, George. George yeah, George, yes. George, and anyway, George has gone into a shadow in front of the Niagara Falls. The picture is so beautiful, you know, George is not uh, visible to us as much as the Niagara Falls are. Yeah, yeah. George, yeah. We can't oh, hear you, George. You have to you're unmute muted. yourself. You're muted. You're muted. You're muted. There we go. So yeah. as we see here, we're we're split between the people who want a big capsule rexes and the people who want small caps or smaller capsule rexes. And I think, you know, you you can argue one way or the other. Um, the points that I would make is 
Um, I used bevel down on the needle. I noticed your needle was bevel up. When it's yes. bevel up and you're putting all this energy I also in, use bevel down. Yes. The endothelium. So I put bevel down. The other thing is um, I, I love the ultra chopper when we had it. We don't have the ultra chopper anymore because that would be very good for these cases. But what we do have now is the MyLoop, and I've used that on a number of these cases, and it's very helpful. So if you have access to those devices, um, they make these cases much easier. Yeah. I think for the black cataracts, I have the two millimeter chopper. All of these are made by Apaswami. For the brown cataracts, I have 1.75. It's long and sharp. Only thing is you need to go bevel down and vertically down. Okay. These yeah. cataracts are very, very thick cataracts, about five, six millimeter or more than that. And you have to go bevel down. And uh, quickly, we'll wind up with the session because we're running short of time. Kumar, you would I want to say something? Excellent, uh, Nishant. As usual, the talk was very good. Again, I'm in the group where I would prefer a 5.5 millimeter axis because worst case scenario, your nucleus goes in. You can still put your lens in the sulcus and then your retina team can take over and the rest can happen. So my thoughts would be like that. And the sharp tip chopper, as Mohan said, I've been using that for years. Uh, works beautifully well in such cases. As far as wound burn is concerned, I've not seen a wound burn since 2001. Maybe because of newer technology that we're using, cold FACO that we're using, I've not seen a wound burn at all. So that, that's a benefit that we get with the newer technology with cold FACO that I don't think we see anymore. You know, the, the wound burn, that, you know, when it occurs, we be careful when you use, because we use a lot of viscode. When you go inside, please aspirate the viscode before you give absolutely. the viscode. Yeah. That is a, one of the most important very, very, very for the burn. Uh, and it can be very exactly. bad. It can be very bad. It can screw up the entire case. Yes, and absolutely. You know, Please ask me point is for the that you see not everybody of the uh, not all of the viewers are probably having access to the technology what we people are using. True. Kumar sir, the only thing about uh, the VR backup was uh, I mean uh, my VR backup is Dr. Nivian. So he is told one thing if you drop a black cataract, he said actually don't place a lens because he said it is easier to lift it out, make sure. an uh, Absolutely, because fragmentome doesn't work much uh, this thing for the brown, the same very brown or black cat. At the same time, if you have a 5.5 millimeter axis, uh, yeah. you can do a sulcus fixation with an optic capture in the same axis. So that's an additional benefit. So I guess you don't put a lens, but it's an easier thing to do. <laughs> yeah. But Kumar, you'll have to sacrifice the rexes if you're floating out a black cataract. Anyway. Absolutely, you will have to. <laughs> you, can't get a uh, no, dude, <laughs> you can't get a 12 millimeter. Go for dude, Ivan. You can't get a 12 millimeter nucleus out of 5 millimeter. When you have a black cataract going inside, you have to sacrifice everything. <laughs> <laughs> that is the take home message. <laughs> <laughs> one case. One, I don't know if you have any viewers. You can't hit the nail on the head. And you know. <laughs> so I think we have come to the end of the session. Dr. Mohan, you have said one more record now. After 50 OPS, you have set one more record. This of the is longest the largest, webinar longest uh, huh? webinar ever. <laughs> longest webinar ever. Huh? No, no, it's, I think it's well, it's well received. I've been uh, getting a lot of uh, reviews about this, raving reviews about this webinar. I'm it, sure we had huge viewership, yeah. I, yeah. I would like to thank all the panelists, but before that, I request my co-moderator, Dr. Ravi Shankar is online there. Yes, sir. Dr. Ravi? Unmute, sir. Ravi, sir. Yeah, Ravi Shankar, please. Can you just the, give the yes. word of thanks? Yeah. It was fantastic and it was a marathon webinar. Uh, very happy to see Dr. George Baiko sitting there from even 6 o'clock. I know. In fact, uh, everybody joined after 6.30. I but know. He's Dr. Been there Baiko since was there before me. Thank you, Dr. George. It was fantastic to have you on board. And uh, great, great uh, cross-learning and a lot of take-home messages all the presenters were excellent. They were up to the mark and uh, every case definitely had, uh, it was a single case, but there were a lot of pearls to take home. But thanks a lot. And uh, it's a pleasure for us from IIRSI to thank each and everyone to have participated in this uh, webinar. And uh, particularly the panelists, uh, you've been wonderful. You took off your Saturday evening and you were here the long three hour, three, almost more than three hour session and I uh, thank each and every one of the panelists who made it wonderful uh, this evening. Uh, I need to thank all the speakers. Everyone had wonderful cases superb. to present and really superb. There was, as I already said, there was a lot of cross-learning and uh, a lot of take-home messages. Uh, uh, thank you once again, all the speakers. Uh,
I would be failing in my duties if I do not thank uh, the uh, medical support of this meeting done by NTOD International. Thank you, Team NTOD, for uh, being so kind enough for supporting this meeting, and we'll be looking forward for many more meetings in future. And uh, thanks to Dr. Kamal once again for uh, making this bang on to the international viewers. As usual, thanks, Dr. Kamal. And a big thanks to each and every one of you. If I have not named anybody, if I have not mentioned anybody, it's uh, it's just I'm, I would have forgotten. That's all. Thank you so much and good night to you. And I would like to thank Filmi my duty. If you don't thank Amar, Amar is the main person who is the, as you all know, is the colossus of ophthalmology for all of us. And he has given this wonderful opportunity to all of us to do this webinar for, under the um, banner of uh, IARSA. And uh, we have got one case, many pearls, but ultimately take home message is we have got 14 gems here. Mm -hmm. The four panelists and the 10 speakers, the 14 gems, the gems of India and gems of the world. Thank you very much. Good night. Stay safe. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.